So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lana, and I'm part of the Fundy Carocho. <laughs> yeah, no ambiance in the background. So I just wanted to let everyone uh, know that we have extra chairs, actually. So that's a good problem to have. Um, welcome to the sixth Fundica stop of the 2016 Fundica Roadshow event. The um, national tour has kicked off uh, at the end of February, and we've been doing this for three years now. Uh, but this is our fourth edition of the Fundica Roadshow. So, who has participated in the Fundica Roadshow before? Raise your hand. Obviously, the partner is you guys. This is not, you guys are cheating. Who knows who fu what Fundica is or does? Raise your hand. Okay. Cool. So, uh, so the Fundica Rocha is really an educational event that we travel across the country from coast to coast. We go Victoria, Calgary, Vancouver. Um, we used to go Winnipeg. We've been to Winnipeg. We've been to Edmonton. We've been to Ottawa. We've been to Halifax, Montreal. And Waterloo is our uh, newest addition this year. And it's to really educate, inspire, and fund entrepreneurs. So the, really, the idea extended from what we do online, Fundica. And Fundica is an online tool that helps entrepreneurs connect funders with entrepreneurs to look for funding. So it's kind of like Google for funding, and it's free. So if you're looking for you know, grants, tax credit, loans, guarantee, or equity, you can actually go in in a few seconds, put your company profile, and you'll be matched with a tailored list of funding programs that match your company. So who is looking for funding here, and who may actually look on Fundica today. That's good. See, now I told you I, I taught you something today. So like I mentioned, it, we started three years ago. And uh, the first year, we really just traveled to five cities. It was a proof of concept, like I was telling Keith. And we just wanted to connect entrepreneurs together with funders. Then when we did a survey and we got, uh, we got the responses back from the entrepreneurs, we, th we saw that about a third of the entrepreneurs that pitched actually received funding. So we decided to, you know, um, grow the uh, grow the event, and we never actually thought that would become a national event. We grew the event from 2013 up till now. We added the educational component, which are the road talks. You'll hear about you know from our great speakers about mentoring, funding, you know VC funding, uh, how to raise capital, non dilutive funding throughout the day, and uh, we hope you get inspired. So what happens throughout the day? The the program is actually split into two segments. This is the educational room. It's open to everyone. So if you're growing or you know, starting up a business and you want to know what will make you succeed, then this is the right place for you to be at. And we've actually, uh, in the other room, we select up to 20 pitches tech with a tech component that will pitch their business to a panel of both private and public funders. And throughout the day, they'll actually be rated on their team, their solution, the quality of the pitch, the market potential, and their readiness for San Francisco. So the panel is composed of those mentors and the public and private funders. And at the end of the day, they will actually select one winner that will take home a you know, chunk of prizes. So they'll get a round trip airfare to San Francisco, three months office space in the Valley. They'll also get to pitch to VCs in the Valley, as well as prizes from QuickBooks, Softlayer, and IBM, uh, IBM and Canary. Sorry, Softlayer is part of IBM. We haven't forgotten about any of you guys that uh, are not pitching or may not, may not win. So we have great perks that are provided by our, our amazing partners. So you know, everyone, when they're starting up, you need to have your books online, so that's why Books and check, and that's why we actually partner up with QuickBooks, uh, a great you know accounting software that provides you know tools for startups that will you know will make you actually start up your business on the right scale. So um, when you're in, when you're pitching for money, um, an investor will actually look you know will ask you if you have your books in check, if you're raising even you know non diluting non dilutive funding even for tax credits. You know you have to have a great you know accounting um, system in place and. S QuickBooks allows you to do that. Then we also have Canary. Canary lets you really test and develop all your ideas on the cloud, as well as soft, uh, as well as IBM that lets you do it, do it as well and lets you actually adjust it accordingly on the cloud. And IBM has a bit more for post commercialization. And last but not least, we also have Nethris. So Nethris, you know. Don't try to do your payroll services manually. You've done it. Uh, you'll sleep better at night if you have, uh, you know, a, you know, an, an accounting, uh, a software that lets you do that for yourself. And Nethris will really facilitate you uh, in order to do that in a, in a better way. So Nethris is actually 
um, waiving the implementation fees and providing the 13th month for free. So they'll actually also be doing a road talk uh, today. And none of this is actually possible without the 2016 national partners. So I'd like to thank QuickBooks. Uh, we also like to thank Small Business BC for hosting us for the third time around. Canary, PayPal, Nethris, and IBM. And I mentioned uh, our national partners, but also PayPal. So uh, we used to have, you know, w when we started Fundica, we asked, actually wanted like a payment service, and we didn't even think twice. We went with PayPal. And uh, Kevin here from PayPal is also present here, and he has, you know, interviews lined up for you guys today. And if you guys haven't signed up for interviews, he'll be he'll be around, and he'll more he'll be more than happy to talk to you guys about it. So uh, w before kicking off the first uh, fireside chat. I'd actually like to uh, get to our national partners to just put a face to their name, and then uh, you can actually connect with you with them. So I'll have uh, Randy from Canary just start up. Yeah. If you want to come here, Randy. Yeah. I go wherever I go wherever Lana tells me to go. Uh, my name's Randy Jones. Uh, I'm here representing Canary today. Uh, Canary is a uh, not-for-profit based in Ottawa. We've been supporting research and education and uh, private sector innovation since 1993. Thanks. So Kevin or John Paul, if you guys want to... Hey folks, good morning. Hope you're all doing well this morning. My name is John Paul Moutinho. I'm with the National Bank and uh, we're partners with Nethris, Payroll Service Bureau that I'll be talking to you about later on. I wish you guys have a great day. Thanks. So we'll just pass you the mic, maybe. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Kevin Zemeckis. I'm from uh, PayPal Canada. Um, I'm responsible uh, for business development and um, market growth uh, here in Canada. Uh, happy to answer any of your um, e-commerce, um, uh, payment processing, um, uh, PayPal questions, um, et cetera, et cetera. I'll be, I'll be outside um, all day. Uh, uh, please don't hesitate um, to ask me any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. So last but not least, I'd like to thank um, all of our community partners and welcome the first Fireside Chat as well. Uh, so the first Fireside Chat is going to be VC funding for startups including Manny Pata from Na New Avenue Capital, Lauren Robinson from Highline, Keith Ippel from Spring, and it will be moderated by Josh Ludgate, who's a, an advisor here at Small Business BC and is helping entrepreneurs like yourselves actually grow and start their startup uh, in Vancouver. So without further ado, if you can actually welcome our panel members with a warm wor welcome applause. <laughs> Shall we? You guys ready to chat? All right. Um, thank you all for being here today. Welcome to Small Business BC. We're glad to have you in with us today. Um, and we've got a variety of topics you're going to cover. Um, but the one we're going to start with is venture capital and getting financing. So we have this illustrious panel here to drop their pearls of wisdom and share with you what it takes to get their money, which is, I'm sure, what you guys all want to get advantage of. Uh, what I'll do is I'll allow them first to introduce themselves. Before that, oh, yes. Can you just share the last bit? Ah. Nice. Or, 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 you're fun. Or fun. <laughs> By the way, you always want to want to know what an investor thinks. Yeah. Right. That's it. It actually says fun right now. Oh, fun. Oh, really? oh yeah. Well, My side only said the F and you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was like, wrong? tell you what he really wants. Uh, Hmm. Well, why don't we allow you to correct for that first impression, Keith, and start by introducing yourself. Uh, hey, everybody. My name's uh, Keith, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Spring. We're an organization that helps uh, high-growth potential entrepreneurs to launch their businesses, grow, and change the world. Uh, so some of you may have seen this week um, coming out in the press that we've launched 
uh, Spring University, which is designed to be the first global program to assist early stage entrepreneurs throughout that critical journey of idea validation, launch, early growth, and funding. Uh, so we have a series of workshops and programs to do that. It's running in 30 plus cities around the world now uh, on five continents. And uh, last year we helped 13 companies in Vancouver raise $4 million in seed one capital and helped 115 entrepreneurs launch 85 companies. My name is Lauren Robinson. I'm a Global Operations Director and West Coast Partner for Highline VC, which is a pre-seed investor uh, with offices in Toronto and Vancouver. We've invested in 64 companies from uh, Halifax to Victoria, so across Canada. Um, and those companies have raised over 100 million after our first investment. Manny Pata. I'm the founder and managing director of New Avenue Capital. Uh, we focus on four pillars. The one that's of interest to you guys would be the, the venture capital and angel investing side. Um, currently have just over 35 investments last time I checked. Um, international as well as in Vancouver. And then the other three pillars are angel, uh, private lending, recruitment, and then social venture and philanthropy. Great. Thank you. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of different perspectives and insight into the community. So let's put an open question. What do you think is the state of Vancouver startup community? How does it feel out there? Sure. Sure. It's getting better, I would say, to start. Um, the one grievance I always have, is this being recorded? Okay, so no <laughs> swearing. Uh -huh. mm. I think it's great. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. Um, you know, I, I've been an angel investor now for about seven years. Um, funny enough, when I first started investing, I didn't do any in Vancouver. Uh, so most of my investments were globally because I personally just thought Vancouver didn't have the infrastructure, didn't have the resources behind it. Uh, what I'm seeing now in the last couple years, which is when I picked up my investing in Vancouver, has been the growth of accelerators like Spring, like Launch Academy and a few others some good VCs um, like Highline and a couple others that are helping to build out the community. And so I'm seeing more and more great investment ideas. Um, what I'm also seeing, which has been a little bit better, has been seeing people start to think a little bit more globally. Uh, so a lot of companies still come to me, or used to, and think about Canada as their growing ground. And I'm like, that's great, but where are you gonna expand after? And they couldn't think past the US or Canada. Now I'm starting to see more people coming in, learning, I think that might be with the influx of other individuals from different countries coming in, and from people just thinking more globally and culturally, uh, but I'm starting to see that come forward. However, and we can dive into this, I think that there is still a lot of room for improvement, um, and there's still some competitive advantages that we have that we don't take advantage of in Vancouver. I always love this question. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I'll speak from a, a person that didn't grow up in Vancouver, but um, was extremely excited to move to Vancouver when we merged two of the top accelerators in Canada together um, in August of 2014 and uh, come out and lead what uh, Vancouver is, is such a growing ecosystem. There still is, you know, I was talking about it in terms of the good, bad, and opportunity. Um, because I think, I think there's a lot of people that are working extremely hard um, to make Vancouver a global power. And I think Vancouver is really well positioned to actually become that. Um, there's still, as Minnie says, you know, a lot of work to be done. And, and uh, all three of us, plus many more people, are, are um, you know, working tirelessly to, to actually elevate the community. Um, and, and there's a lot of great talent here. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of um, elevating that talent and, and making sure that there's more to, to serve the, the great companies that are up and coming. Yeah, and then maybe just to add to that, I think some of the areas that are exciting for me would be a significant increase in collaboration between uh, the support organizations. Um, you know, everybody from Futurepreneur to Van City to the accelerators and the incubators, BCIC. Um, you know, compared to five years ago, dramatic difference, uh, and I think it's to the benefit of the entrepreneurs. Um, significant growth in some key sectors uh, like. Um, uh, impact tech, uh, people who are trying to change the world for the better. We're seeing, uh, and interestingly enough, seeing a lot of really good buzz about the VR and AR scene in Vancouver. Um, probably 
we're farther on the front end of that than maybe we have been in other sectors in the past. So that's been kind of exciting to see some of that buzz and that energy around that. Um, and uh, the other piece too is I think we're getting to a bit more of a critical mass of talent. You know, starting to get a few been there, done that people uh, with the Lighthouse Labs and the Code Cores and the Red Academies of the world, starting to see a more critical mass of talent to be acquired and, and brought into teams. Um, so those are really, really good signals in, in the market. Great. Um, it kind of carries on from that and it's probably partially answered. Um, but what would your vision be for Vancouver startup community and, and what's it going to take to get there? I'll start off with this one, but I, I, I think um, to Keith's point, there is a lot of people that are really trying to work hard and um, elevate the community, but I think there still does exist a lot of duplication in the community and um, to become a globally recognized uh, ecosystem, there, there needs to be a lot more working together and that's difficult because there's always you know, people's own interests and whatever it is. But the one thing that really uh, excited me when I came to Vancouver was a lot of people were talking about Vancouver before they were talking about their own organization and how Vancouver has the potential to become something um, globally recognized. And, and it seems as though a lot of people are really rallying around that, more so than other ecosystems in Canada where people, um, you know, they, they're they're more focused on on what's what's happening within their own um, their own organization. So I would say there's uh, on the company side we're we're almost there in terms of the types of companies and that are being developed. I would like Vancouver to be the spot when someone goes, I'm about to do a capital raise in Canada and I am going to Vancouver, and then stop, and they don't need to drive take a plane four and a half hours to Toronto. <laughs> Right? Let them do mining, let, th let them do all the other bigger test stuff over there. Let's have the, the hub in Vancouver large enough with angel investors, with venture capital funds. Um, you know, we've got that proximity to Silicon Valley and into Asia, which I actually think is gonna be the next hub in terms of all the businesses and the, the high tech projects that I'm seeing. So let's make Canada the tech hub that people go to raise their funds, that the top companies come to, that the top talent is here and that we're developing. We've got the lifestyle, we've got the mountains, we've got the water, Toronto doesn't. And so <laughs> let's do that. Let's keep people here and let's make it like, hey, yeah. I'm gonna raise some funds and I'm gonna enjoy the lifestyle as well. That's what I wanna see. <laughs> and another thing about Toronto. Yeah. Just kidding. Yeah. Um, Those maple leaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maple leaves, enough said. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things I think for me, vision of the Vancouver startup community is that Vancouver, uh, I think in the next five years, it has the opportunity to and must establish itself firmly on the global stage of entrepreneurship. And so I think that from my perspective, we just need to stop doing things locally and we need to start doing them globally. So it's one of the reasons why we did Spring University is so we could actually put our flag in the ground and say this is a global program that is running out of Vancouver. I think we need to attract global players into Vancouver, uh, whether that's a Techstars or it's a WeWork or uh, an Impact Hub, people like that. I think we also need to acknowledge the people who are doing work already in Vancouver, but in other ways, especially around capital, right? Like Manny, Version One Ventures, Boris Wirtz, other people are already investing in a North American scale, on a global scale. We need to acknowledge that and grow that. Um, and then the last piece is, is we need to do it in a way that uniquely recognizes Vancouver for what it is. We are not Silicon Valley North. I'll throw up if somebody says it again. Um, and so let's embrace it. So all the things that Manny described, but I also think we are in a unique place, not only to be the hub for capital, but a hub not only because the capital is here, because, but also because it's the easiest for anybody in the world to, to fund something here because we have the, the track record with Asian investors, because we have the track record with US investors. And so we're, we actually are, I think, fairly uniquely positioned to do that. And I think in, in three or five years, we can realize it, so. Perfect. Um, a few years back, I was in the illustrious position of talking to people like you and chasing for money. Uh, and my first encounter, I went a dragon, one of the dragons, and I thought, perfect, I'm gonna get some real insight. And I said, great. Listen, I don't want your money. I just want to know, where should I be going? What am I doing wrong? He says, oh, oh yeah, there's only four guys in Vancouver to do that. They're not here right now. So to Manny's point, we, we need more concentration. We need more volume and willingness to get invested. And a little bit beyond that first step, 
help them grow and establish and stabilize themselves. Um, and that leads into the next question. How will entrepreneurs in Vancouver, how can they scale their business? Is it US? We've heard a lot of global conversation. What's it going to take to help them get there and scale? So I think there's an interesting and very basic answer to this, which is um, every startup, many of you in this room, you guys are solving a specific problem for a specific demographic, a specific target audience with a specific solution. And so practically speaking, you just need to say, where are my customers? Um, where do I need to go get them? So um, it is important to note, like I know a company in town who uh, did customer interviews with over 250 people and they spent oh, about $250,000 launching their product. And they went down to a trade show in San Francisco to do that launch. And 10 minutes into the trade show, the first prospective customer came in and said, oh, great idea, do you do this? And the company was like, and it's because they talked to 250 customers in Canada and nobody in the US. And the first person in the US recognized that the most important thing was something they didn't have. So, so you just need to, I, I think, when it comes to your business, how you scale and where you scale is just based on where your target audience is. And the same exact thing applies with capital. There's this phenomenal weakness that we as entrepreneurs all face, which is, you know, Chris, copy pants, right? So he's like, I'm working with people who are creating content, so he's not going to, to call an insurance salesman to try and sell him his product. That's called target marketing. So when Chris wakes up tomorrow morning and says, I need to raise capital, all entrepreneurs, what do we always do? Oh, who writes a check? I need to raise my money in Vancouver. Well, how many people will, will buy into a content play in Vancouver? 2%, maybe. Go raise your money where the money is, right? For your business, for your idea. There are some local people, but the people who say that it's hard to scale in Vancouver because it's hard to get money is because they're trying to raise their entire round in Vancouver and not trying to find it from strategic investors who understand the industry and the business model and are geographically relevant to the customer. So if you want to scale, go to where the, the highest concentration of your customers are and go to where your ideal investor is. Well said. I'll, I'll uh, layer on what, what Keith is saying, and I, th I think Keith's very right in, in saying get out of the, not just the building, but get out of the province. Um, one of the things that, that we saw with some of the companies that we invested in uh, this year in Vancouver, uh, three of them were actually fintech companies, and a lot of the value of um, the Highline platform was having that ability to easily uh, you know, spend time in Toronto with a soft landing spot and an easy way to get to know the fintech community. Um, as a Vancouver company that could build product in, in Vancouver and, and still stay based here, but also have the connectivity to um, other ecosystems like New York and Toronto and, and on the East Coast and, and other places that are outside of, of BC. So. It's, it's scaling, but it's also um, thinking about benchmarking your company outside of Vancouver. There's a lot, you know, Vancouver is a very supportive community, but sometimes um, the perspective of knowing what your competitors are doing in San Francisco, in New York, in Hong Kong, in wherever it is, um, is a really good mindset to have. And, and there are more and more companies that are thinking global from day one. And, and I think that's a really positive development. Yeah, let's, let's take it a step back here. So the first question I typically will ask uh, companies that I'm working with is, what is your goal? And if it, Every company tells me they want to be a billion dollar company, I'm not doing as many investments as I've done because not every company is a billion dollar company. Not every company is a hundred million dollar company. Um, but going from zero to 10 or zero to 30 and selling in two years is a great model, right? And so the first question I always ask is what's your goal? And I've had companies I've invested in who said, Manny, we're first to market, we're gonna get to 10 million, we're selling. Great, if you're bringing me in at 500 or a million dollar valuation, I'll look at that, that sounds great. So. It's all about defining that piece first. And once you have that, then it's great. If you're building a $10 million company, you don't need to be thinking globally, right? If you're going for a billion dollars and that's your goal and you've got a crazy idea that's gonna revolutionize what's happening, then that's your goal. So that's the first step I see in terms of companies. Then the second thing I say is building out your test markets. So Keith made a great point. 
of this company that didn't look in the U.S. even though they did all their tests in, uh, in Canada. We've actually started doing some interesting stuff with companies where we'll go to markets where it's a, an insular market where one language, one country. Turkey is a great example. If you have a B2C product, I always tell my clients, hey, can you test market this in Turkey because it's such a huge consumer market? Let's see what happens there. And then you can take those ideas, let's do that in a couple more countries, and then we can build it out. And a lot of people don't look at those countries because they see it as one language, one region, et cetera. So those, those are the couple of keys. A, think about the size of your business and what you want it to build to in a reasonable time period. If you're saying, I'm going to be a billion dollars in 20 years, great, good luck, find some other investors. Um, but if you're saying, I want to grow ability, I want to scale, and here are the target markets I want to get into, that's when you can start looking globally for your business. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, should startups change their pitch depending on who, what type of financial institution they're talking to? And should they change their projections based on who they're talking to? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I think, I, you know, one of, one of the, maybe, maybe everyone's going to disagree with me here. We're laughing because... You want to get up here? No, the same question was posed to a panel like this in Victoria on Wednesday, mm. and the, the consensus was never. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? It's okay, it's being filmed. You're pretty sad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can look at the old tapes. No, I think, I, okay, here's my perspective <laughs> for what it's worth. Yeah. Um, it, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you're hustling and fundraising in, in many ways is, is like any sales pitch that you do. And if you're not doing your research in advance and knowing you know, what the investment thesis is of the, the fund or the investor that you're talking to, what they're interested in, um, what the stage is, hopefully you're talking to an investor that is gonna invest at the stage that you're at, but um, there, there's always tweaks. You should have a master deck that um, you, know, you work from and, and you're not completely overhauling a presentation every time you do it, but there, there is tweaks that that should be done for for every presentation, and the other the other part is, um, you know, I think the question was um, for U.S. investors: should you change it? I, I think if you're benchmarking yourself to what inv U.S. investors and global investors are looking for, you don't have to change it for U.S. investors. You're already thinking that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's uh, clarify. Uh, I don't think Lauren or myself. I think Keith agrees on this side, you're saying change your projections depending on who you're talking to and say it's bigger for some than others. Uh, that's just going to irritate investors. Um, but there's a couple things. It's, it's targeted marketing or pitching, right? So if let's say you're doing a social venture, for example, and you're talking to someone on the impact side. So for example, if you're pitching me as an impact side, well then your deck should probably be 70% on the impact and 30% on the, on the actual revenue side. However, if you're pitching a fund or somebody else who's thinking it the opposite way, then focus your deck 70% on here's the money it makes and here's how that builds out. And guess what? It also does some good and build the branding marketing side. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's what companies and people do on a daily basis. Uh, when you write emails to individuals on the same project sometimes, you're not going to copy paste. If you do, people can see that. It's like a resume cover letter. If you write the same cover letter as generic, everyone's told you before, it's not going to work. You need to tailor it to the job you're looking for. So why wouldn't you tailor your pitch to it as well? But I wouldn't agree with changing projections and numbers. And I do agree with Lauren that uh, everyone has now bought this uh, new piece. I had a company come into me who was raising $5 million. And if you were an investor in Canada, it was $5 million Canadian. And if you're an investor in U.S., it was a $5 million U.S. valuation. And I said, stop it, guys. Right? Like, that's A, ridiculous. Uh, but you, you guys are laughing. But people do this, right? They're, they're taking advantage of the dollar. Go raise in U.S. funds then. Right? The, peop the reason people from the U.S. are going to come and invest in your business is because they don't get the EBC tax credit or whatever they're going to be doing here, but they're getting what they call the, uh, the dollar tax credit. Right? They're getting an exchange rate bump right now. And so let them have that advantage, a advantage. And you'll actually get some better investors as a res result of that as well because it's another reason for them to put money into the business. Yeah, so then the only things I'll add to that is, um, you know, to Manny's earlier point, you know, your vision and your goals and your exit strategy never change. Those things are constant. Um, who your target audience is, how you're different from the competition, those things are constant. So then you do tailor around the pieces that uh, Manny and Lauren did a great job of describing. Just remember 
that when you're pitching, it does make a difference, though, if you're pitching people in Vancouver versus, say, Silicon Valley versus, say, New York, because here people will raise a half a million dollars on a 2.2 or 2.4 million Canadian pre. And then you'll go to the Valley and they're raising 600 or 750 US on a 4 million US pre. So the challenge is if you go to the US and you say, I'm raising 500,000 Canadian on a 2.2 million Canadian pre, I'm gonna look at Chris and go, what, what are you on crack? Like, that's just dumb. That's not enough money. But that's the way they think. They're not right or wrong. That's just their perspective. So it is important to note when you are looking at your ideal investor, if your ideal investor is here, Sometimes, and it is, sometimes it's brutally hard to impossible to bridge around with people in Vancouver and people in the Valley because they just think differently. There's nothing wrong with that. Go with your ideal investor. That's where people get caught because they're like, well, I'll, I'll give a certain round size and a certain valuation to guys in the Valley and then I'll try and do it here. And then later they try and reconcile the two and then you just look bad. So just don't do that. Do it here first, raise your first half a million and then go to your 250 US yeah. you've already raised Perfect. Um, the next question that's written down here. Um, how and when should entrepreneurs approach investors? And is it ever too early? Let me start. Oh, He's on a roll. Oh, give me that mic. Um, it's, it's never too early to ask for advice. But if you're coming to me with an idea on a napkin and nothing's been done, that's too early to ask for money. Um, I always say ask for advice first. Uh, the one thing in Vancouver you will find is a lot of angel investors who are willing to mentor and help. Um, there's a number of companies, individuals who have come to me with business ideas a year or two before they need the money or they don't even need the money, they just want to have advice. And when you come to advice and you can help the investor shape what your business is going to be moving into, the likelihood of them investing is much higher. That's probably different for a VC, but from an angel investor side, I like to see businesses early, help shape it at the beginning and start starting point. I like that type of the business. That might not be every investor, but that's definitely for me. So. Yeah, I think just to Manny's point, I mean, finding people that are can get excited about your business and you can build a relationship over a period of time. We always love, you know, meeting people early, but uh, the different perspective that I'll say is uh, the good investors are trying to do deals just like yourselves. <laughs> and, and um, you know, if, if we can meet, um, love meeting uh, ambitious entrepreneurs that uh, are trying to, to conquer the world and, and build globally ambitious companies, but um, we're trying to do deals too. And um, so no problem in having a, a five, 10 minute conversation with an entrepreneur and hearing what they're doing. Um, but be really conscious of an investor's time. We see over 1,300 investment opportunities a year. And that's a lot of people to um, interact with. And some of them we, we do interact with and some of them just come through on, on an email basis. So just be very conscious about w the, the timing and the, the stage and what y the, the value of exchange that you're trying to capture in that small period of time. So I'll just add a couple more things. Um, relationship build is key. Um, here's one of the reasons why I love having entrepreneurs speak to investors early is because um, I actually think it is the, the best external motivation to create traction in your business. Because I dare any of you to talk to Manny today and then four weeks from now, call him up and say, hey Manny, remember me? And he'd be like, yeah, how's it going? You'd be like, good. And he's like, so what's going on? Well, not much. Right, it'll be the last time you talk to Manny, right? Because he's got lots of friends to chit chat with. So, so I actually love the concept of building a relationship, but, but it also means every time you talk to Manny or every time you talk to Lauren, that uh, you're gonna come back to him and say, this is what's happened in the last four weeks. This is what I've learned. This is the progress I've made. This is what I learned doesn't work and here's how we've changed, right? Because we're, that's how you separate yourself out from the crowd. Now I'm gonna give you a piece of advice which when I usually get an investor to have a beer with me and actually tell the truth, um, it, it is that if you guys make a sales call, right, and you have an off day, then the reality is you get off the phone and you're like, oh, just so didn't do well on that sales call. But you know what, call back in three months, six months, nine months, all is forgiven. That is never the case with investors. 
If you call an angel investor, if you meet with an angel investor and you're, you're ready to pitch for a round, and if you aren't ready, you never, ever, ever get a second chance, period. 1,300 deals. So how is Lauren going to say, oh, Chris had an off day. You know what? I'll give him another chance. Is she going to do that 1,300 times? No way. She just Time does not allow it. So, so the important part for you is if you, you know, wake up on the wrong side of bed and you have an off day, don't lose sleep over it. But be ready to raise your round. Be educated. Be prepared, right? So how many people, there's a few older and younger people in the room, right? RSPs, what's the most important decade? The first why? compounding interest. So what's the most important round you do? The first, because all the terms and conditions and the dilution and the valuation cascade across all future rounds, right? So be ready. So if you meet Manny and Chris says, hey, I'm going to do a convertible note, da 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 da, da. And Manny's like, yeah, I'd rather do a safe agreement with these terms. And then Chris is like, what's a safe agreement? And then Manny's like, X, <laughs> right? Because you're not ready. So be ready when the time comes. Okay, I'll be ready. I'll be ready. <laughs> well done, Chris. Um, other than that mistake, what's the most common mistake entrepreneurs make when they show up? Most common mistake is oh. not doing research on what what a particular investment um, thesis is, what the investor is interested in. Um, Tailing, tailoring your your conversation pitch um, and just your ask, not having an ask actually. Thanks. Uh, most common mistake I make I see people make is overinflating their sense of self relative to the competition. Most entrepreneurs don't. Like, because it's your baby, right? Like, your baby's beautiful, it's not ugly, right? It's better than any other baby out there. And so when you're saying, hey, this is how we're different from the competition, and then often an investor will go, actually, I don't buy that. And here's why, and you're like, oh. So I, I think it's really having an intense amount of humility and market awareness and customer awareness to know that, practically speaking, early on, you're probably not super different from the competition. So what you need to do is say, Here's how we think we're different today. And here's what we're going to do in 3, 6, 9, 12, 18 months to continue to increase our ownership of that white space. And so I think that that's often a mistake people make. It's funny, when Keith said that, I automatically thought of that four-quadrant graph and how everyone always puts their thing up here. And everyone else is over here. They suck, but we're amazing. Um, uh, you know, I'll combine these two, and I want to say one thing afterwards. But um, um, looking at the investment thesis side, you know, I've had companies come to me and say, we're first mover advantage, we're awesome. And I used to joke around with companies that I believed in something called the Snapple effect, which was I always wanted to be number three, so you always had two people who could buy you. Um, but, but let's leave aside from there. Um, Overpromise and underdeliver. Um, so if you think I'm not paying attention during your presentation because I'm not taking notes, oh, I'm paying attention. Um, and even if I'm writing something else down, I'm still listening to what you're saying. And I might not invest the first time you're around, but I'll have you come back in in four weeks, or I'll have you come back in six weeks, eight weeks. And I will see if things slip up, or if graphs change, or if the numbers haven't worked in metrics. And I've seen this with companies that I work with. So under promise and over deliver. That's always what I say. So if you're saying it's gonna take me two months for traction, say four to me, and then come back in two and say, hey, guess what, I hit the target. You're gonna make me much more likely to want to invest in you, because then I'm gonna believe what you're saying. because. I don't see 1,300, but I think my analyst and I looked at over 400 deals last year, right? We invested in a, in a certain number, number of those. Uh, and that doesn't count the ones that we're getting through emails, et cetera. So we're not a massive fund like them, but we're, we're writing checks. And I will write checks for startups because uh, I'm believing in the people. I come from a people background. I'm not a pure finance guy. Uh, so I will write checks because I believe in people because the business I'm investing in is most likely not the business that they're going to sell. But if the people stay the same and they're strong, I'm going to keep them. So as an individual, under promise what you're gonna do for them and then over deliver it. So just a quick add on to that. So a tip that I love to give entrepreneurs and you guys can take this and use it as you see fit. Uh, hear what was just said about under promise over deliver. So what you actually wanna do is you wanna create a, a monthly I, you know, perspective investor update email, right? So traction, sales and marketing, product, team, finance and capital asks, always have an ask at the bottom. So the day that you start to capital raise, pre-write, 
the next four months of update emails. And then what you do is you look at them month to month. So we're in April, so you write May, June, July, August. And then you look at them and say, hey, if somebody sent this to me, does that look like progress? And usually after the first cut, you look at it and you're like, Ugh. and then you change it. And then the next cut, you're like, oh, that's crazy. And then you find that middle ground. And then what you do is you always push to exceed. And your goal is a 5% conversion rate. So here's what I mean by that. If people care, you'll actually get a 65 to 85, 85% open rate on that email. If you are over delivering on expectations, a minimum of 5% of the investors will proactively respond to the email and say, great update, we should grab a coffee. 5%, that's your target. If you do that, you will close a killer round at the highest valuation with the highest chance of oversubscribing. And we read those. Yeah. Yeah. I read them. Yeah. Now, for two months, they're absolute crap. Uh, then, I, uh, <laughs> then I delete them and I unsubscribe. But if they're actual value adds and reading, I like to read these things. I, I do it on planes, et cetera. I have a folder that says, read these updates. Yeah. And then Second I do those afterwards. Suck it back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's been a lot of advice through this discussion this morning. Uh, the last question, we've only got a couple minutes, so maybe the one piece of advice uh, you would have for entrepreneurs here today. On capital raising or in general? I'm going to go in general, because I think we've covered the capital raising from multiple questions. Uh, there's only one perishable resource, and that is time. It's, you know, uh, you know, spring is my fourth startup, and so... If I were to play it all over again, there is no other important factor. You just need to move. Uh, you need to move on getting your market validation. You need to move on getting growth. You need to move on getting the right funding at the right time, whether that's grants or loans or equity or contests, you name it. Um, you, there are 16 other people minimum doing what you're doing. Um, if you don't do it, they will. If they do it first, you lose. Focus was going to be mine, but I'll go to a, a second, which is spend time outside of your bubble and whatever that bubble is, um, because there's a lot of different perspectives that exist uh, globally in other ecosystems. It allows you to um, get perspective on who you should be benchmarking yourself um, from and, and lets you stay humble. Those are what I was going to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> get people around you that are going to elevate you. It would be the last piece that I would say. Um, working in, I've never gotten an opportunity to work in an academy or you know at a launch or a spring, etc. But from the companies we've been looking at, we just did a project. I had my analyst uh, do a, a survey of where all these companies have started from, and I think over seventy percent were through an accelerator or through some um, non-formal group of mentorship. And I've noticed a correlation. I can't say it's definite yet, but I've definitely noticed a correlation in the last couple of years. We need to see some more research on that to see if it works, because then we'll go exclusively to those. But surround yourself with other startups uh, that you're going to be working with, even if they're not in the same space. I've seen this through EO, which I'm a member of, where we have forum groups of people in, uh, from different types of businesses. And it's amazing how much I learned from construction guys. And, and other things that are completely different than what I would learn otherwise. So I guess that's a little bit getting out of your bubble, but um, it allows you to uh, to develop in, in different ways. That would be the, the last piece that I can add, but they took the best ones, so. They were focused. They knew what they were doing. Uh, well, thank you all for your time this morning, your advice, your insight. Um, encouraging people to look beyond Vancouver, but start here. It's a great foundation. And the better they do, the more we'll attract investors to come here, and the stronger the future will be. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Madden. So um, anyways, uh, my name is, so I'm with the IBM office here in Vancouver. And uh, um, as part of the, the conversation that was happening today, one of the things I'll point out is um, uh, you know, one of the, the suggestions was to get out to meet people, to, to, to develop those personal relationships. And uh, that's one of the things that we offer, so across, across Canada. So we've got uh, almost 20,000 employees in Canada. There's lots of IBMers around. Um, there's a lot of experience. And uh, uh, feel free to reach out to us to ask us questions, ask us our opinion. Um, and, you, you know, hopefully that'll be, that'll be helpful for you. Um, 
So what I wanted to do today is, is talk about platform-based developments, but quick sort of survey, I guess, in the room. So how many entrepreneurs do we have here or want to be entrepreneurs? Yeah, that's good. And how many of those folks are dealing with, uh, uh, with data or systems in general? So more than half. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, and um, so with, with that in mind, what have been some of the challenges that people have run into as they go to develop their applications and or scale them or secure them? A anybody want to volunteer some of the challenges that they've had? That they've had? Anybody? Yeah, up upfront cost. Yeah, and and can you be more specific? Is it is it the uh, the people or the systems or every everything or? Right. 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 And what about cost transparency? So how much do I think I'm going to spend? It's part of it too, right? So, okay. Anybody else have any? Um, Comments about what's been problematic for them as they as they go to, to, to start their business or, or scale their their ideas. No. What, one more time, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I you know my dad was an entrepreneur since before I was born, and and he would struggle right with um, with trying to figure out not just how to uh, inventory things and you know keep the lights on in the building that he had to rent and had a staff of people and all those things so all of those capital costs that he had to had to manage and uh, and that was a, a huge huge problem for us um, uh, you know as a family when I was young but y you know eventually you figure that out but now you know it's it's we we're talking uh, with the other folks there's never really been a better time to be an entrepreneur right the barrier to entry to things like technology is is uh, is so low it's practically non-existent right um, and this is one of the things that we talk about and it's very very true so, you know, th th uh, the folks in this room, who has laptops? Yeah, who has Wi-Fi? Okay, everybody, good. Because that's, that's kind of the barrier now, right? If you don't have a laptop or Wi-Fi, I can't really help you, right? But <laughs> you can do a lot on your phone, but not everything. Um, but literally, everybody in this room now has access to technologies that, that even uh, two years ago were only available to like the largest charter banks in Canada, right? only available to large government. But today, everybody has access to it, right? And you have it available to you, in a lot of cases, at, at no charge, right? So you can get started, you can get your architectures done, you can try stuff out, you can realize it doesn't work and try again, w at really little or no cost other than your time, okay? So you gotta keep this in mind in that, you know, th literally the world is your oyster and you have a lot of opportunity uh, and upside and, and and uh, I'll throw this out there, that there, there, is, there is a fundamentally no uh, limitation to scaling from a system side anymore, okay? So like there really isn't. And, and I was the high performance computing manager for Western Canada for IBM for years. And, and I, I never had a problem that was too big, right? I had budgets that were too small, but I never had a system that, was too, that was, wasn't big enough. Um, now, and so part of the question that I get asked is, okay, well, why is IBM in an entrepreneur session, right? You know, what's, what's y you know, I mean, let's face it. Most of my customers, like 80% of my customers, are, are the, the largest customers in Canada, right? They're banks, they're insurance companies, they're government. And, y you know, we do pretty well. We've been doing pretty well in those areas for decades. Like, literally in Canada, we've been here over 100 years. But the problem is, is that if you look across the business landscape, right, what's going on? It's, it's disruption, right? So if I'm a legacy organization that's been around 100 years, there's a really good chance somebody's got a good idea that can do things better than the way I can do them, and they're not gonna be impeded by that, that legacy, right? That baggage, right? And we see this all the time, right? right? Who, who remembers, like, you know, taking their pictures into, to, uh, uh, um, you know, like London Drugs and getting their photos developed? I mean, that, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, we all, most of us have done that, right? There's a, a few of us that are, a few that are younger than that. But, but um, we used to do that. And that business is, is, well, it was totally gone away. And then I was at CES this year and they reintroduced eight millimeter film. So, so I mean, you know, what's old is new again. But, but um, you know, uh, uh, YouTube, right? How many people have cut cable, right? So a third of you, yeah. I mean, I have two and I mean, there's no point in having cable anymore, right? Um, we don't have to Uber in, in, in BC yet. Um, we all hope that we will have Uber in BC sometime soon. Um, 
uh, even my next door neighbor who actually drives taxi is hopefully is hoping that Uber will come to Vancouver. So, um, Air Airbnb, who's used or has uh, has put their property up in Airbnb? Yeah, right. Now, if I'm a traditional hotel chain, I'm freaked out, and and we've seen this, right? Look at all the the consolidation in the hotel industry in the last year, right? So, from IBM's perspective, I have a lot of legacy clients, and those legacy clients are going to be disrupted if they haven't been already, right? So, uh, you know, Hertz. I mean, Hertz is an IBM client, right? What what are they worried about? Well, everything that looks and smells like Uber, they're worried about, right? So, more car sharing services. Car to go. Who uses Car to go, right? I mean, a lot of us have tried it or use it every day, right? So, so from IBM's perspective, if we don't get into the disruption space, if we don't enable that disruption, you know, our traditional customer base will continue to be disrupted. So, so the 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 uh, the opportunity for IBM is to to help enable this next generation of organization, this next generation of company, into disrupting their businesses, right? So whether that's manufacturing, whether that's insurance, whether that's finance. You know, whatever it is, energy, everything that is legacy will be disrupted. The question is, who's doing it? You? I suggest that, I suggest to you that, yeah, it'll be you. So, um, uh, and, and, you know, what's interesting, too, is, is we've seen disruption outside of our traditional markets, but we've also seen a tremendous amount of disruption from inside our own customer base. And I'll use blockchain as an example of that. So everybody knows what Bitcoin is, right? Yeah, does anybody actually use Bitcoin, just out of curiosity? Yeah, a couple, okay, good. So um, the underlying technology of uh, Bitcoin, an immutable ledger, right? Most of the banks a uh, year ago, finance companies a year and a half ago or so, it, it, you know, it's interesting, it's an academic discussion, it's used by crooks, that was kind of the, the general feel of it. But when you look at the underlying architecture associated with it and the concept of blockchain, and you look at what happens when I can tie my ledger with your ledger, your ledger with her ledger, her ledger with his ledger, and not worry about an intermediary bank, right? I, I mean, that's, that's disruption at its most fundamental level. And as a result, every single institution financial that we deal with today, banking, insurance, all have blockchain projects underway, right? And IBM's been a big proponent of the, the open blockchain program for part of this reason, right? And that this... If, 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 I'll, I'll say it here, blockchain will fundamentally change the way we do finance in all industries, even commerce, okay? It may take a little while, but you'll see it. It's somewhat inevitable. And that has massive repercussions um, for government, right? So, and, and so, it, so if for anybody that really understands blockchain, you're in a good spot because you're on the ground floor. <laughs> so anyway, it's exciting on that side. Okay. Um, likewise, there's a... Um, so there's a lot of, of uh, businesses and a lot of organizations that we deal with today and a lot of startups who don't necessarily um, produce an end thing, okay? They're not necessarily producing an app. They're not necessarily producing uh, physical goods or delivering physical services. They're an intermediary, right? So through uh, an API-based economy or, or a, a, in an API-based um, economic world, you can make a lot of money just by shuffling things around, right? You add your little bit of, you take some raw data or some data from one piece source, you ingest it, you do something interesting with it, like do analysis, and you fire it back out again uh, as, as another API-enabled service. And this is, if you haven't looked at this, or if you've been concerned about developing a whole app and trying to figure out how to do that, Developing an API-based service as an intermediary has a lot of interesting business value. And if you want to talk about that a little bit later, that's, um, I'd be happy to do that. But increasingly, um, a, a lot of folks are, are looking at developing their applications and doing so by componentizing or connecting things together. And, um, uh, and so, so for most organizations, as you, as you start, you got an idea, you want to start to develop something, you know, most of the projects in here have some IT components, so most of you will be familiar with this, right? Y you know, how many people have worried about, you know, the networking, the servers, the operating systems, the security, right? I, I mean, it's, it, who's lived through the, this kind of pain historically, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's taxing, right? <laughs> it's taxing. So, so we, we largely try to automate a lot of this. Then they get to the next part of the stack, right? So there's the physical part. So, so this physical part is often referred to in cloud as infrastructure as a service, right? It's hardware stuff in a big building connected by networks 
and and there's lots of different organizations that run it. Ours is Bluemix, or sorry, ours is um, Softlayer. Um, we have Canadian data centers, so Toronto, Montreal today, and we're hoping to get one out west. Um, and then beyond that, you've got the operating system layer, right? So operating system middle runtime, so that's kind of your platform. Um, and then beyond that, you've got other things, right? So, and this is what, what our platform brings, is the infrastructure in Canada, the, uh, the, the platform itself, so operating systems middleware, um, and then all of the other kind of cool stuff or, or, or better stuff that's there. So connectivity for mobile, Internet of Things, cognitive, which is Watson, um, analytics, uh, integrated DevOps, flexibility, API, uh, new business model. So it's the entire stack. So, and there's other, there's, you know, there's, we're not the only one, right? There's lots of other providers that provide stacks like this, ecosystems, if you will, um, that take you right from the ground floor up. But what's cool about this, if you haven't used it before, and this is platform-based development, is that, you know, this is available to you on a consumption basis, right? So, and more often than not, it's, it's no charge, right? I think through Amazon, IBM, uh, at least those two, there's free tiers of service that are available for you to get your ideas up and running, right? So, uh, any questions on this just before I go to the next slide? And there's quite a bit here, but yep. Uh, a application programming interface, yeah. So it's it's a way to say this is my thing, this is what it is, this is how you might want to use it, and then you use that definition to attach to it and connect through it. So maybe you're super simple, yeah. Uh, I S A A S. Infrastructure as not a service or a platform not a service. Yep. Then what kind of service? I said your IBM provides the software as yep. a service or Yeah, so so IBM we provide all of this. So we provide if you want just a server, okay? We'll give you just a server, bare metal, right? So you can do with it whatever you want, right? So we and uh, so you can get just the, the infrastructure, so just the, the server or storage or network or all of the above. You can get the operating systems, the applications, the development environment, and then you can get prepackaged components that run as well, like software as a service. So you and you can buy this incrementally. So um, hardware, as an example, is available by the hour. Okay, so if you just want a server for an hour, right, you can get a server for an hour, virtual or physical. Okay, which is a bit unique, and it's like, oh, I really need a server in Hong Kong. I, I can do that, right? So. And does that help answer your question, or? Okay. Uh, you come to another question. Uh, do you c does IBM the IBM Blue Mix yep. have the feature of the v virtual function virtualization? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So um, Blue Mix, which we'll get into in a minute, is based on OpenStack. So OpenStack is is one of, if not the defining standard for virtualized systems, right, and virtual infrastructure. So we follow that protocol. We also work with other things like VMware. So if a client has a lot of VMware legacy, we can tie in with that as well. But but fundamentally, Bluemix is based on um, on OpenStack. Okay. Yep. So get into that. Okay. So the Watson platform, and again, there's multiple platforms out there, but this is our ecosystem, right? So. Um, you know, you have the, the open source community pieces, right? Java, .NET, PHP, Python, Ruby, Node-RED. So all, all the sort of standard stuff that people would expect to see, um, uh, especially a lot of the, the younger folks that are doing development, they, they really know this space. So we got that, okay? Um, then we have the, uh, the third party stuff, right? So we have integrated um, uh, Twitter data, right? So if your application wants to pull data in from Twitter, there's a um, component for that. Um, weather. Um, how many people know that IBM bought the weather network in November? Yeah, so we, we, we bought the weather network, not the cable TV channel. So my, my goal of being on, on TV isn't, well, YouTube maybe, but, but anyways, that, that dream won't be realized. But um, uh, open data, Box. So anybody have used Box, right? Cloud-based storage, yeah, yeah. So that's in there. Um, Twilio, um, uh, one of our other, uh, Redis is, is very popular, and Pitney Bowes. Everybody remember Pitney Bowes, right? <laughs> no, I mean, it's cool, right? What does Pitney Bowes do? Well, they deliver mail, right? They make postage machines, right? But one of the cool things that we work with them on on this is, is they're really good at telling you if that address that it, the client has typed in is deliverable. 
is that a real address or not? Needless to say, they know if that's a real address or not. And you can actually call that up that says, you know, deliver my pair of shoes to your address. It'll validate that for you. So you don't have to do that. You don't have to write that. You don't have to, it's done for you and you just call up this component, okay? So that's all cool. Um, and then what we've also added is the IBM sort of extra stuff, right? So this includes, um, uh, so security, right? How do I ensure that the stack that I'm building, the application that I'm building is actually secure? What, what process is it going through to actually make sure that everything is patched? And then can I actually go through the whole runtime and assess, the, is, is it doing what I'm telling it to do securely, right? So we, we have a bunch of different security features in the platform that you can call in to basically audit your security, okay? Which is very, it's, you have to do it. And a lot of people don't think about it until after they've written their application. So being able to call this in at the ground floor is, is really critical, okay? Um, you know, message queuing runtimes, Docker. So has anybody heard of Docker? There's a few people, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, a few people. Yeah, so we fully support Docker, which is just another virtualization um, component. Allows you to easily share kind of entire uh, multiple components together as one. Um, you know, secure gateways, uh, development operations. So again, this, this whole thing that we talk about is not just for development, but you can actually run your business on it. So you don't have to start and then try to move it somewhere. You can actually uh, take the, the most simplest idea grow it to the be the you know the next facebook like it this the platform grows massively on a worldwide scale um, you know big data and analytics right so i'm going to build an application that tracks everybody's uh, that that tracks um, you know tire wear on cars okay throw an idea that's going to dynamically measure the wear of of everybody's um, uh, wear on their tires, okay, that's a, it, so in other words, I got a big data problem. I'm gonna have a lot of data that's gonna come in. How do I manage that? And when I do my first run of that application with 50 cars, I'm gonna get a certain amount of data, and then my investor's gonna say, how do you scale that to f five million cars, right? Need to be able to do that. Yeah, there, there's, there's multiple engines actually. So that's, so the question was, is what is the analysis engine that's within there? We actually have multiple analysis engines that are available and you can use open source like R, you can use things like SPSS, you can use uh, Cognos and there's others as well. So again, you can pick the one you know the best is probably the easiest place to start. Um, and then uh, mobile first, right? So I'm gonna develop an application and by the way, that needs to be mobile enabled. And so whether that mobile component is a phone, a tablet, doesn't matter, or is it some other machine, like an IoT device, right? I'm gonna make smart socks. And I think literally at, at CES, there was somebody making smart socks, right? And those smart socks are gonna talk back to the cloud, to infrastructure, I'm gonna do analysis on them, and then provide feedback to whoever it is that wants to know about socks. So but there was literally, there was an app that, that that's that. Um, and then last but not least is is Watson. So and anybody, does any, everybody remember Watson from Jeopardy from 2011, right? So it, in, in the game show course, you ask it, you give it an answer and it has to pose a question back, right? But this idea that you have um, a cognitive system that can be trained in a particular domain and that it becomes a, a subject matter expert, okay? So you can actually ask it questions, and it comes up with a thesis. It goes to find information that it's been taught about its thesis, like to de defend it, and then it, it ranks all of that information to provide you with an answer, right? And for those of us, so those that watched um, Watson on Jeopardy, when it answered, it had a certain confidence, right? I'm really sure this is the answer, because I've got a bunch of supporting data. Or I'm gonna give you an answer, but I don't think it's right. Right, and it knows that it's not right, or it knows that it's not likely to be right. It's a better way of putting it. So, but Watson, as cool as that technology is, is actually instantiated here within Bluemix. So it's available to developers that want to develop stuff. Okay, which is really cool. Um, uh, the Toronto Raptors um, are actually using one of the Watson components here, which is called Tradeoff Analytics, as part of their. They have a whole new. Um, trade platform, so um, 
uh, player trading platform, and it's literally, anybody remember Minority Report with all the screens around it? It looks almost exactly the same. They've got touch screens in front of them. They've got touch screens behind them. It has all the available player statistics, and it has the trade-off analytics to say, well, if we can get this player, then that'll be part of the team, and he'll fill this spot, and that means that we don't need this player, but we need these other two. So the money ball kind of idea, right? But uh, this is um, uh, specifically for, for uh, it, it's been built specifically for the Raptors. So now we'll see how it works, right? Because <laughs> the trade's coming up, I think, next month. And this will be the first time that they will have used the platform. So we'll see how successful they are in the upcoming season. Um, yeah, we're pitching it to Vancouver, too, for those locals. So um, anyway, so this is what Bluemix brings, is all of these different things, right? Um, and the reason that people, yep. Yes, yeah. Um, I wonder uh, what sort of APIs have you developed for help saving issues? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how much it has broken since the uh, effort? It, it's a very good question. So, um, and I can take you through some of it offline, but as an example, so what Watson initially did and does now very, very well is anytime you have very large amounts of, of text data, right? So. Initially, it was all just structured information, right? So text. You could train it to read and understand everything that's in that body of text. So and as a result now, I think as of last fall, um, Watson is actually FDA approved in oncology. Okay? So that's how much it knows that it can actually be FDA approved. Not as a physician, but as a physician information assistant, right? So human still makes the last call, but, but now you have an, a, an oncologist who inevitably has a lot of workload, the ability to say, hey, this is what I'm seeing, what do you think? And based on the entire body of evidence that's available in oncology, including the 16 reports that were published between breakfast and lunch the today, it ingests that and presents that information back to the oncologist, right? So decision support. And, and um, in University of Toronto right now, Watson is being trained as a, uh, as a lawyer, and it's a program called Ross out of the University of Toronto, right? There's also a bunch of other, other organizations that are doing the same thing. They're training Watson to be um, a smart legal assistant. Why? Well, because legal is a lot of text, right? So and, and increasingly what we're doing is teaching Watson how to look at understand music, right, audio, how to understand, it already understands multiple languages, how to understand um, uh, uh, images as well, and images and video as well. So it, it, you can imagine a system in the very near future that understands what you're saying, which is today. It understands what it's looking at, which it does some of that today, and it understands sort of the world around it, right? So very much a cognitive, um, human-like behavior system. And it's, you're, you have it accessible here, yeah. It's also, so in a way, it is also a data mining tool. Yeah, a very yeah. effective and efficient data mining tool. Th think of it as a data mining tool, which is true, with context, right? So today, if I Google Apple, right, uh, I'll get everything from the fruit, but pr probably more likely these days the company, right? And I'll get a l whole bunch of different things. So with Watson, if you ask it for an apple, it'll want to understand the context of the question. Is, is, are you asking about Apple as, as part of a recipe, right? And it understands the data that it has behind it, right? It'll understand the context of it to say, you know, is this Apple that you speak of? <laughs> are you trying to refer to the company, right? Uh, or um, the, the technology company, the music company, or some sort of fruit, right? And it, but it's the context that really differentiates it, okay? So, yep. More like an AI platform, yeah. Right. Um, how much training do you have to give it? To uh, I wonder if uh, oh, how much support can IBM provide to entrepreneurs uh, through this platform, Bluemix yep. platform, to first learn the APIs of yep. a, uh, Watson, how to train it, and how to develop applications on top of Watson. on top of it. Yeah, yeah. So it's it. It, it, because Watson is a spectrum of services, the, the answer, of course, is it depends. And, of course, like any good private company, will do anything for money, 
right? Um, but I'll talk about specifically about the IBM Global Entrepreneurial Program, right, which will help get you to that, that idea. Um, but Watson as a cognitive system needs to be trained. So you need to spend the investment of time to train it. And it's, it's a non-trivial exercise for that specific component. But there's other aspects of Watson which are far easier to, to integrate with in the short term. Okay? So just going through here now. Um, see, if it was a cognitive system, it would just know that I wanted the next slide. So. There we go. Okay, so the reason that people are, or organizations are looking at platform-based development is really simple. It's about speed. It's about how fast can I develop and deliver and or fail and re-deliver what I'm trying to accomplish, right? And so, you know, traditionally, j just doing some of this basic stuff and everybody, anybody that's done this understands, you know, the, the, the laborious process of getting things just to work, right? So being able to turn what is conventionally a three-day process into something that is under an hour, um, and we can fire up, you know, hundreds of servers in, in, in less than a, you know, certainly in an afternoon with no problem at all. Um, <clears throat> so who's using start, uh, Bluemix? So again, the platform. So lots and lots of startups. And again, the reason is both speed and cost effectiveness, right? The barrier to entry is zero, right? Or, well, laptop. You need a laptop and Wi-Fi. But other than that, you can get started, right? You need a good idea. Um, it is a program, programming in, um, uh, environment, so you do need to know how to do some level of coding, right? It doesn't do magic yet, um, but it's still pretty, it's still very, very usable, right? Um, and then uh, other enterprises. So a lot of, you know, okay, not a big surprise, a lot of our traditional customers, right? So whether it's GM or Royal Bank or Citigroup or Ford, or I mean, you would expect that, it, but even those organizations that have long-term um, development projects that have huge ranks of developers are using the platform as well. And again, it's about speed, it's about cost, okay? Okay, so just, um, yeah, so, you know, Bluemix has, has become very popular even though it's only been around for about a year and a half. Yeah, quick question. Jump on the boat. Yeah, yeah, and actually, you can use the service um, for everybody. Gets a minimum of thirty days access, but through the entrepreneurial program, we can give you a full year of access. Um, and then, with that, even on top of that, it's consumption based, right? So, if you're just piloting things, if you're just trying to get things started, you want to make sure something works, right? It, you're not going to drive consumption to the point where we'll bill you, right? So, you can do most of that, if not all of that, work at no charge. listing uh, yeah yeah and and yeah. more yeah so the question was is how many different languages does it support yeah it supports all the popular ones right so if you have a particular penchant for uh, you know PHP or Python or or Java or whatever or .NET for that matter you can use those skills in the platform and I can go over the very specific details with you afterwards so what which, which one I, it's a good question I don't know let's we'll look at it afterwards okay um, and then uh, what we've also done too is, is you know, we support, um, <coughs> we actually have open source products, so Mongo, Postgres, Elasticsearch, Redis, um, available as supported entities, right? And this has been one of the challenges with open source stuff is it's great, it's cool, but if something goes wrong, I got no backup, right? I'm on my own. I have the community, which is great, but if I have a, a particular data problem that is impacting my service level to my clients, I, I have to figure that out on my own. So what we offer as IBM is actually the support through an acquisition called Compose that actually can help support those open source products. Yep. Question? Yeah. Sorry, I, I let IBM stuff since I was young. Talking about brother to yeah. install or deploy IBM. Uh, I know that IBM they have a user group in uh, Vancouver by Paul Yip. Yep. Uh, could yep. you uh, yep. tell him to go pull mix for the next for the next uh, one, yeah, group. yeah, uh, from Zandi, he knows me. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, it is a good point. So again, around the relationships, so we do have various user groups for a lot of the different products, um, and uh, and but that's a that's a good suggestion is to have Bluemix brought up in the next one. Uh, IBM uh, user groups are very really good. I like it very much. We have good food and good drink. Yeah, and really good knowledge. <laughs> don't uh, don't hesitate to enjoy that next time. So the. the 
so just the, so the the platform is one thing, but what else? W w but that's not the whole story, right? So I got a good idea. I have the technical capabilities, but what about the business side, right? And when you talk to a lot of entrepreneurial groups, it's like you know I, I've got my idea, I've got a good technical team behind me on how to actually get it done. What about the business side, right? What are my business activities? How am I going to sell this stuff? How am I going to how am I going to package it for my market, right? And this is where where we have this idea of the Bluemix Garage which is to really take you through you know, and, and refine kind of the whole thing, right? Not just the technology component, which obviously we're really good at, but also the rest of that, that project, right? How, how, how are you gonna break the part into manageable pieces? How, what are you gonna do when pieces don't work the way you expect them to do? How are you gonna drive this to market? Um, and what the Bluemix Garage does is it actually brings, it, it, this is a physical center in, in, in Toronto at the moment, and we bring the folks in, we actually go through their ideas, we actually sketch everything out, make sure that it's on target. We, we basically um, go through the whole ideation process, go through the technical architecture, actually build the applications, and we go through this whole process typically in two to four days. It's, it's always less than a week, though. So, and for larger commercial clients, we charge for it, right? So it's, it's not a lot. It's, you know, if you're Citibank or whatever, 15K isn't, isn't going to be much money. Um, but we do have quick start packages for sort of traditional large clients. Um, but what's different for this audience is we have this, this product or this project called the IBM Global Entrepreneur Program. And the idea is, is that, okay, I, I, I'm an entrepreneur, I don't have any money, right? Or I have a limited amount of money. Um, and I need to, I, I want to get my idea to market, right? So this gives you the, the environment, so Bluemix, for example, to build, to launch, um, and ultimately to scale that idea um, to, a, to a, a feasible business size and to do that with predictability, okay? So the specifics of the program are a couple of reasons. Yep. Uh, yeah. How to do that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through that. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's okay. So again, the, the whole idea here is, is to, to, to give the startup community a way in which to deliver their ideas, okay, and ultimately drive that innovation. So, so right now there's two types of, of uh, cloud credits that are available through the program. And I'll give you the URL, which I think is the next slide on how to actually register. Um, but um, we've got right now one, one program basically where if you're a new startup and, you haven't been in, and you've been incorporated for less than a year, um, you can get access to uh, $1,000 um, uh, a month of IBM Bluemix and uh, $1,000 a month towards SoftLayer. Okay? So those sort of foundational services to get you started, okay? And that's for up to 12 months, okay, no charge. Um, and then the, there's another uh, layer to this as well. So if you're a little bit larger organization, um, it can go up to $10,000 a month, um, and it, the, the, the credits can float between the two services. So when at some level, they're, they're kind of the same service, right? So depending on what it is you want to do for it. But again, um, even with this or without this, you still have the ability to access Bluemix today. It's a free account, log in. You can actually get your ideas instantiated. You can get, um, uh, th there's some run books and other things there to help you along. Um, and then there's the IBM team, right? So whether it's in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Victoria, it doesn't matter. There's IBMers across lit literally around the globe that are available to help your idea um, uh, get legs behind it. And th so the, the, again, one of the unique things about IBM's presence in this space is that one, we're global. So it's like I have a great idea, and, but I'm here in Vancouver, but I really want to deploy it in, in Southeast Asia, right? And maybe I need data centers in Southeast Asia, or I need to transfer data back and forth. We can do all that, right? Um, one of the unique things here is that we don't charge for data transfer between any two sites, right? So if you say you have a photo sharing application or an Internet of Things application, and it's going to generate a lot of data, well, traditionally with cloud-based services, you get paid, you pay by the, the, the bit to move it from one site to another. With IBM SoftLayer, even if you have a tiny virtual machine, say in Hong Kong, right on the, in the cloud in Hong Kong, and you need to move data to and from it, you don't pay for that data transfer. So that's a huge cost savings when you operate this stuff. Oh, is uh, the SoftLayer good for the thin, thin client or a single client? Uh, for thin clients? You have to have to explain to me later what you mean, but but yeah, but is it cloud? It, it, if you most of the applications or a lot of them that we look at are cloud connected, so are mobile connected. So I think yes is the answer, but let's go through that a little bit later. Okay. 
Okay, um, and then there's uh, uh, there's additional support services like go-to-market support, right? So again, how do I take my good idea? How do I take my my app, my platform, and how do I actually get it out to the market, right? Um, you know, IBM's uh, global services division and and um, technology services division sells other organizations' stuff every day. It's a significant part of our business, and we actually work to sell a lot of these these um, uh, applications to uh, other uh, to our customer base, right, on a global basis. Um, technical expertise, that kind of goes without saying, but it's it's really helpful when you're trying to, for example, how to figure out how to make a redundant environment, how to scale something, how to connect A with B with C, when you only have experience in A and C, right? We can do all of that. Um, a business mentorship services, so again, this is really valuable. And again, we, we talked about this before in that, um, you know, a lot of um, uh, startups don't really have a sales team, right? Or they have a limited ability to sell their stuff. Right? And so coming up with a bit of a sales plan on how you want to do that, how you want to execute it, how you measure that, I mean, these are some of the, the, uh, the, the stuff that IBM can help you out with. Okay? Um, so again, run and build your app on Bluemix and uh, take a look at SoftLayer as the platform. Um, and then this is uh, the key contact for the Global Entrepreneur Program, which is um, Sonam. And uh, this uh, URL, so developer.ibm.com slash startups, or even just IBM Startup in Google, you'll find it. Okay? Uh, thanks very much. I guess that's it. So questions? Yeah, thanks for the questions so far. appreciate it. Kay. If anyone has a question, I'll come with. So, How safe is your cloud? Um, so we get, people are always concerned about cloud and, and safety, um, or uh, information safety. It's as safe as you make it. So, and, and what I mean by that is that if you don't have proper um, data protection measures now, or you choose not to implement them in cloud, you're going to have the same problem, right? So the... Um, the underlying system is, I would say, safer than just about any on-premise system today. Okay? So I'll give you an example. So today, if you have existing IT, can, do you know exactly when anybody comes into the network and what they do on the network and when a change gets made? Is that logged? Right? Does somebody look at the logs? Is somebody looking for abnormality in those logs? So most organizations would say, yeah, sort of, maybe, kind of almost, but not always, right? And, and if you're really, really tight security, um, uh, a secure environment, and you have all the latest patches, and there's somebody actively looking at, at um, uh, all of the different aspects of security, then that's great. But again, security isn't something you do once. It's a daily activity. You really need a team that's looking at all the available vulnerabilities across all of the components of the system and looking for... Um, not just the systems misbehaving, but the, the users and the, mis the way they misbehave. So in cloud, it's actually easy because you're, 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 you typically have to look at that as you go forward and as you move stuff to cloud. It can actually be, in a lot of cases, much safer than your own in-house IT, right? Even though it's in sitting in Iraq in Toronto, for example, or Hong Kong or Japan. Okay, but good question. No, I can't. So, but I'll, I'll, I can, I can uh, find some of the security people within the IBM team, even here in Vancouver, that can walk you through the step-by-step -step layers. So, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's it's a huge yeah. The, so, security in cloud is probably the single biggest inhibitor that folks have, right? oh, I'm going to put my stuff, whatever my stuff happens to be, out there somewhere, and because it's not in the room next door or under my desk, I, I don't feel that it's secure, right? E even though, you know, that, that may, that may, be, may be on a wide open wi wi Wi-Fi network with no password, right? So, so anyway, but, but yeah, we, we, can, we certainly address the security aspects of cloud with, with, with unbelievably deep rigor. Okay. So, yeah. Any other question? Yeah. 
some in the global entrepreneur data uh, data solutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So within Bluemix, and I, I could walk you through it afterwards. All the different databases that are available. Yeah, and we run. Uh, there's a, all the common sort of open source databases, as well as some unique in-memory databases. As a cl as uh, and uh, there's different databases for different types of activities, right? So, um, and we support. There's at least six or seven that I can think of that are already in there. So, but yeah, you're all you're welcome. Can IBM staff get into the data that I store in this cloud? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, the, the way it works is, and I'll use the BC privacy um, guidelines as, a, as, a, as a, a way to explain it. So um, in BC, if you're dealing with private, in, in private citizen data, you're supposed to store it in BC, right? That's the default position. You can, but if you look at the privacy leg legislation that we've looked at, right, it also has to be, you can also do it if it's in Canada, right? And so we, we have data centers in Canada. Um, the hardware teams that manage those data, t so the, the vast majority of the hardware that is uh, managed is done automatically. So it's through automation, right? So we don't have people actually going and physically touching the boxes, right? So that, that normally doesn't happen. If it needs to, okay, so say there's a hardware failure and a drive has to come out, right? So data on the drive and so then there's a very well-defined auditable process where the client is notified that this needs to happen, that a specific individual will come in and do that, and that if it's a drive, for example, that that drive would be destroyed, it wouldn't be reused or recycled, right? So theoretically, yes, somebody could access the machine. Now, all the systems typically have, all of the applications that have systems have a data, uh, data encryption at rest, as an example. So the, the, the data that's physically on the machines is always encrypted. Um, and then typically the client would manage the keys, right? Um, and, uh, and then, uh, so for any time where there's the theoretical possibility of somebody, like an IBM employee, accessing the box, so that is a fully audited process where the client is notified and kept in the loop, so to speak, so they understand exactly what's happening. And the, the privacy regu regulations basically require you to do that. So to say, yeah, I need to go in for this reason, here's what's been done, and here was the outcome. So that whole um, transaction or touch point is audited. And again, this is something that doesn't normally happen in-house, right? If something dies in my server in my server room next door, I just fix it. But again, there's no guarantee as to what actually happened when, like, where did the drive go? Oh, I don't know. I don't have a process for doing that, right? So it's a good question, and yeah, we manage that. So. One more time, sorry? The encryption, yep. is uh, still using the general AES-256? No, it depends on the app. IBM. It depends on the, the app and the customer's request. So there's different levels of encryption for different types of activities, right? That can be chosen by the client. And again, it depends what you want. So if off-the-shelf solution isn't sufficient, as an example, say, say you want to use quantum encryption, right, on something, right, which we don't have, right? But you have access to the bare metal system Right through your VPNs, and so we can set it up so that you can, um, uh, so that you can, uh, and we can even modify in some cases the physical hardware in the cloud for you for your particular requirements. So, say you wanted a cryptographic coprocessor in a box, we could still do that, right? And we have a couple of clients where they actually customize the hardware. Yeah. Yep. For example, when we set up set up a server in the Blue Mix. Does this include all the firewalls, or we need to install by ourselves? Uh, okay, so or the, so the security device. Um, so two things. So as infrastructure as a service, there's a firewall service that you can use. Okay. Yeah, it's add-on. Yeah. So so again, this is the, this is where you need to be careful, right? If you if you grab a bare metal server and you don't put any firewall in front of it, it doesn't have a firewall, right? So if, but if you have a bare metal server and you, you use the firewall service or provide a firewall service in front of it, then you have firewall, right? So again, it doesn't necessarily come automatically. Now within Bluemix, Bluemix is a platform as a service. So again, a bunch of the different layers are already taken care of, right? So in that case, um, I'd have to get back to you on the specific networking aspects of how the firewall works, but there is a layer of protection associated with it, yeah. 
Not sure how we're doing for time. We just have one more yeah. question. Sure. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Peter. You made me uh, have so many questions. I appreciate it. Uh, I'd You're like welcome. to know that uh, we got into the boom mix, right? I like to work on the file system they use. Is that the high performance file system or uh, the head to HDFIS? We, we actually have, again, the, the answer is it depends. We have multiple file systems depending on the type of application that you need, right? So, for example, we do have HFS, right, um, as part of the Hadoop environment, but you wouldn't necessarily use that for um, an application where you want in memory performance, right? So, so we, we, we have multiple file systems, and you have the flexibility, depending on the app, to choose which one you want to use, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it's, so thanks very much, everybody. Um, lots of good questions, so thanks for that. Um, if you get a chance, check out the URL and or sign up for Bluemix. Thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. So up next, you're we're going to have uh, the Road Talk by Canary. We'll just, we're just going to move the chairs, and we'll transition to the next Road Talk. So if you guys want to follow up with Peter, you can just ask him questions outside the Road Talk room. So if you can uh, just give a big welcome of applause to our next speaker, Randy Jones from Canary. He'll be providing you the talk about building your business in the cloud. So Randy is a senior director of technology innovation at Canary. Randy works with the Governor of Canada to, de to deliver digital infrastructure that supports research, education, small business growth, and Canada's digital economy. Canary has been supporting us since the very start of the Funding Roadshow, and we're very happy to be partnering up with them for the third time again. So without further ado, Randy, take it. Thanks. Thanks, Lana. And uh, thank you for your, your time today. Um, how many people here know anything about Canary? Lana, one there. OK. <laughs> uh, and the other question I have for the audience today, how many people in the room would identify as a, a software developer or someone who's building a software-intensive business? Three, four, wow, smaller than most stops. Okay, a little bit about Canary. So, so Canary is a not-for-profit corporation. We're based in Ottawa. And since 1993, we've been uh, supporting research and education uh, and innovation in Canada. Uh, we do that through a number of programs. And if, if you went to university or college uh, in Canada, you, you probably used one of our programs without using it. So we, we run uh, what's known as a National Research and Education Network. It's a backbone network that carries uh, traffic nationwide and interconnects the provincial regional networks to which all the universities and colleges are connected. So a lot of researchers use uh, that network. Uh, we also have a, a program where we fund uh, the development of research software. So if you're a researcher and you've gotten a grant, and uh, rather than spending that grant on developing some custom software, uh, we will fund uh, the development of that software as long as it's uh, done in a way that it's reusable as a platform or a service. So we maintain a catalog of software for researchers to use. Uh, we also uh, provide digital infrastructure in terms of uh, we run a federated identity management system um, nationwide so that uh, if, if you are a researcher at a school, uh, you, you can be uh, auth authenticated back to your home institution. And finally, for this crowd, uh, we run a, an infrastructure as a service uh, cloud uh, that runs on top of our network. And I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about that later on. But first, um, building your business in a cloud. So uh, Canada's economy is shifting. It's, it's changing from a resource-based economy where we uh, sort of you know, cut down trees, pull stuff out of the ground, or, or harvest uh, unfortunate animals. So this, this new economy is more and more data-driven. You heard Peter talking a lot about that. And uh, you know, data is sometimes referred to as, as the new oil. Um, Cisco uh, publishes a report uh, every year uh, that's based on their analysis of traffic that they see through core routers at the backbone of the internet. And uh, they're estimating and forecasting that by 2019, uh, there'll be 180 petabytes of data generated per year by a, a city of 1 million people. So that includes internet of things. So, you know, data is, data is really important. And 
Um, most of the software uh, development people that I meet at uh, these events are including some form of data analytics in, uh, in their solution or algorithms. And it, it's very powerful because uh, you, know, you can take data from one source and use it uh, you can cleanse it, you can join it with open data sets, and then gain new insights on how your business is running or um, how, how processes within your business can be uh, optimized. And uh, it's, it's really uh, not a, a thing of science. In fact, data science is, is coming down to more of a commodity thing. Um, it's, it's used uh, everywhere from optimizing, uh, you know, the, the menus at restaurants to uh, small businesses. In fact, um, use of data, the studies have shown that use of data is uh, a, a key factor in improving the uh, revenue per employee. Um, companies that exploit data tend to have a, a four, four times the uh, revenue per employer employee than, than those that do not. So um, it's not a bad thing to do. <laughs> so some of the technology trends behind, uh, you know, data analytics are the, um, the, the creation of very low cost, dense, scalable cloud-based storage. So Right now, um, the market price for a gigabyte of, of storage at rest is about three cents, um, three three cents a, a month, um, and that's that's uh, for example Amazon's Elastic Block Storage. Three cents, per gigabyte. three cents per gigabyte per month, and uh, it gets even lower cost if you go to uh, archived storage. So for example, Amazon has a service called Glacier and uh, it's for the, you know long-term storage of data. It would replace tape-based storage and it's one cent per gigabyte per month. And you can actually set up you can actually set up policies in your elastic block store retention policy so that after a certain period of time it'll it'll push the data from uh, EBS into Glacier, it's, it's a great service. Other technology trends, well obviously we have ubiquitous, uh, uh, high bandwidth, low latency connectivity. We have devices that are everywhere, we carry them around in our pockets, uh, the Internet of Things is, is, is coming. And we have um, applications that are very useful that provide situational awareness to this data. So. Uh, common common things like like Facebook, social media applications, and underpinning all of this is is cloud computing. It would not be possible without cloud computing. So, um, for those of you that that sat through Peter's uh, talk, you you probably got the impression that uh, he's encouraging you not to build infrastructure, and and that is the biggest message that you could take away from these talks: is please do not buy bare metal and st stick this under your desk and set it up. Um, it's, it's, it's a much better idea to um, lease someone else's equipment. Focus on your business. Do not focus on building infrastructure. Um, it, take, take the valuable money that you have and put it, put it into building your business, sales, marketing, product evolution, but, but do not build infrastructure if you can uh, avoid it. Peter spoke to some of the scale capabilities in the cloud. It's uh, it's truly low barrier to entry, uh, entry and you can uh, scale globally. Okay, so for those of you that already know uh, how to develop in the cloud, you, you're probably going to tune out a little bit here, but I, I just want to set a few baselines for cloud computing so that uh, those that don't have the opportunity to to uh, work in it daily can understand a little of the lingo. So technically speaking, cloud computing is uh, on-demand access to compute network and storage resources. Um, it, it's, it's provisioned and deprovisioned uh, quickly through uh, cloud management software. And one of the big, um, the big things that the cloud brings to the table is um, pay for use services. So you only pay for what you use. That's the great thing about cloud. If you only use uh, an hour worth of, of, uh, 
a server, you only pay for that hour. However, the, the, the bad thing about cloud is you pay for what you use. And if you don't understand how your application uses uh, cloud resources, you're exposing yourself to uh, what most people will call bill shock. Um, you can get a nasty bill at the end of the month if, you're, if you've uh, consumed a lot of resources. Uh, there are three, three types of uh, cloud computing models. Um, so if building software is like building a house, then infrastructure as a, as a service is the foundation. Um, it's it's uh, the physical uh, computers, storage, and networking equipment with a layer of virtual virtualization on top of that. So if you're building an application, uh, infrastructure as a service helps, but it, you've got a lot of work to do to build all the services that you need on top of that. And then in comes platform as a service. So again, if building an application is like building a house, platform as a service provides um, prefabricated components. So all the useful things that you need to build software like uh, databases, load, load balancers, uh, firewalls. There, there's a very long list of platform services that you can use. And you, you will pay for each one of these services that you use, uh, even the ones that are free. So as an example, um, uh, Amazon has a wonderful service called the uh, Key Management Service. So it allows you to put together a public public key infrastructure for your application, which is a very tricky thing to do, and it's free. But it consumes um, uh, EC2 resources. That's their elastic compute service. So you'll be paying for their infrastructure services that the platform services sit upon. And finally, there's software as a service. So again, uh, if, you, if you don't want to own a house, uh, you, you can rent a house, and uh, the same with software. So uh, QuickBooks Online is an example, um, Office 365. There's like thousands, if not tens of thousands, and most developers are developing software as a service today. So why does this matter? And why, why am I talking about the cloud models? It, it matters because it affects how you build your, your business. It affects your time to market as well as your cost. So, if, you, if one of the things you care about most is getting to market as fast as possible, plat platform as a service will generally get you there sooner because you have less uh, software development and integration time to do that uh, relative to infrastructure as a service. However, if what you're concerned about is your, the cost of your infrastructure, uh, you'll, be, you'll be generally paying less by using uh, infrastructure as a service because you're not paying for each of those prefabri prefabricated platform services. And finally, there's vendor lock-in. And vendor lock-in is a very interesting topic in cloud. Um, platform services today are not standardized across the major public cloud providers. So Peter showed you a, a good list of the Bluemix things. They're great. They're amazing services. Amazon has an equivalent list. Um, I'm sure IBM and Amazon would argue that point, uh, as does Microsoft with Azure. Um, but the point is, when you use those services, you're locking into that vendor to the degree that you, you know, write your code to use the services APIs. So if you, if you want to maintain independence of your cloud service um, provider, um, be careful what platform services you use. Sorry, about the vendor lock in. Uh, is it unsafe on using Microsoft? Microsoft uh, single sign on? Is it safe to use Microsoft? Unsafe. Unsafe to use Microsoft? Single, single sign on. Um, I, I can't comment on whether Microsoft single sign on is unsafe, but I can say that um, Microsoft powers. Uh, Microsoft components like Active Directory and Active Directory uh, file services provide single sign-on for the majority of uh, enterprise clients, and that same technology is in their cloud. I would be shocked if it, if it had uh, significant vulnerabilities. But you could ask Microsoft. <laughs> 
Um, more, more to the point of, of vendor lock-in and cloud. So one of the properties of cloud that is very powerful is horizontal scaling and the elasticity of, um, of uh, com compute instances. So um, when I use the term um, cloud native application, what, does, it, does it resonate with anyone? Has anyone heard that term cloud native? Couple, okay. So, <laughs> the photographer, <laughs> scratching your face. Um, so, uh, you can run just about any application in the cloud. But most conventional enterprise applications were designed to scale vertically. In other words, adding more RAM and CPU to your 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 server. Cloud native applications scale horizontally. You cluster your compute instances. You break down your workloads into smaller pieces so that you can horizontally scale by adding instances and subtracting instances. And it's, it's essentially you use automation to build uh, closed loop control systems to monitor how, the size of your, your clusters based on your offered load. So you'll, you'll add instances. Uh, to meet the demand that may be changing, the so-called Super Bowl uh, case if you've got a consumer app. Or you would shrink the number of instances to control your cost because the more instances you have, the more you will pay. And most platform services uh, provide high availability um, features. As an application, you have to configure those to, to be used correctly. And this is, a, this is an important consideration when you're designing your application to figure out how you're going to develop it for high availability. I can't answer specifically for Microsoft, but I, I know that you can achieve high availability with their cloud services. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, but the op the automation code that you write needs to use your cloud provider's APIs to instantiate compute instances and to turn off compute instances. And the more code you write that uses those APIs, again, the more you're locked into the, to the vendor. And I, I call that the, the cloud trap. In fact, you know, there's a, a number of approaches to automation. The most common is outside of your, your cloud provider, you, you can write um, automation code that uh, uses the cloud provider's API. But uh, Amazon, for example, has an, an awesome service called uh, Lambda, and it's built right into their platform services. So Lambda will react to events uh, coming out of your uh, application and s horizontally scale your clusters up or down, depending on the policies that you set. But again, as great as Lambda is, um, you know, if you're using something like that, be be aware that you're you're essentially committing to uh, that cloud provider for a long time. Your switching costs will be higher when you move to another cloud provider. So, uh, yes. Um, there there are some open source uh, frameworks that help with this. Um, I would say, in, in my, from my viewpoint, they're not widely ad adopted. But as an example, there's a uh, Apache project called jCloud. And it provides uh, a layer of uh, vendor independence. So for example, if all you want to do is spin up instances in, in different clouds, you can use the facilities of, of jCloud to uh, do that in a, in a is it J for Java? Yes. Yeah. Um, and again, vendor lock-in, you, you, you can't avoid vendor lock-in. The, the question is, how much vendor lock-in do you really want to have? Um, as I say, platform services are great. They'll allow you to get to, to market sooner. But be careful how many of them and where, where you use them. Um, for example, uh, let's say you've got some co-ops on your team or some students. And the student decides, hey, I'm going to use this platform service because that's going to save me two days off my project timeline. And that, that is a, a, a good thing for your, your student to do. However, the, the choice that the student made for you on your behalf in all good intention may cost you a heck of a lot of money down the road as you're 
um, as you scale your business up and your offered load becomes greater. So, you know, the advice there is uh, have, a, have a plan for how platform services get used in your, in your application. Always jo also, always develop for code portability. Um, make sure you understand how you would migrate your assets between clouds. So things like um, uh, virtual machine images, uh, understand how you would take one out of one cloud and put it in an another cloud. Likewise for data synchronization, having a, a strategy for moving data sets between clouds will, will be helpful if you're interested in vendor independence. Uh, the, the other thing that is really important is understand the relationship between the offered load on your application and its consumption of cloud resources. Um, because understanding that will allow you to understand what your total uh, infrastructure costs will look on uh, cloud A versus cloud B versus cloud C. Uh, and this is important in a competitive market in, because you may want to, uh, you may want to at some time uh, attempt to cost optimize your, your application to move by moving to a different cloud. And in Canada, uh, there, you have a number of options now for uh, cloud service providers. Back in 2012, uh, Canary uh, looked at cloud technology as something that Canada was lagging in and, and one of the um, issues in Canada was that there were no cloud providers at that time that guaranteed data sovereignty. So in other words, that your data stayed in Canada. Today there are many, many options for that, ranging from small companies like uh, Oro, uh, Cloud A, Internap, to, to really the, the giants of, of uh, technology. Um, IBM SoftLayer, I believe, was the, the first big player to come into Canada with data sovereignty. And just in the last year, uh, there's been a huge shift here. So uh, in, uh, in June, uh, Microsoft announced two data centers that uh, they would be building out, and they've, they've built those, and they are now online. Uh, in September, DigitalOcean, who is a cost leader for basic infrastructure in the US, um, announced that they would open a region in Canada, and that has just recently come online. And, and when you think about it, uh, digital ocean, you can buy a virtual machine for $5 US a month. Um, that's, it's a very small virtual machine, but uh, that's a very attractive price. Uh, that's uh, one virtual CPU, half a... Uh, uh, half a gig of RAM and I think about 40 gig of storage, something like that. But it's on their site. Yeah. Peter? Just, I was just going to mention, um, so, so with cloud services, it's, it's pretty much the Sorry, so just with cloud services, make sure you understand where all the costs are. So there's costs in the CPU, in the memory, and importantly in the data transfer. Right, and, and, and understanding and being able to predict what your application does in the way of data transfer to and from various points in your, your architecture is really important because that's actually where most of the cost sits, is actually in the data transfer, not so much the processing of it. So. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And uh, to that point, as an example, let's say you, you have a very hard requirement to develop a high availability system. So you look at uh, what's known as availability zones and you're transferring data between those availability zones to synchronize it. So in, in many cases, you will, you will be paying uh, bandwidth charges for the transfer. So it's important to note. Um, and Amazon as well, uh, just in January, they announced that they'll be opening uh, Canada, a Canadian-based uh, data center or region. Um, it's not online yet, but it's coming. So all in the last year, three uh, additional large players have come into the market. And this is going to create competition. Sorry, did you have a question, yeah, sir? Uh, so you have the small players and also... So we have the smaller players and also the big players like Amazon and Google's and Boxes. How are they different compared to their services? I mean... How are they different? Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> well, that, that that's a very big question. I mean... I, from the very basic infrastructure as a service, they all provide a very common set of ser services. But as you get further up the stack, 
uh, into some of the higher value platform services. They, they differ quite a bit. Like Peter was saying, yeah. Blue Mix with Watson, uh, I'm not aware of another vendor that has that, so that's a big, big difference. However, if you were marrying yourself to open, so open source like uh, our based um, frameworks, you, you know, that's open source, everyone, everyone okay. offers that. Um, so the question was, you want to transfer a lot of data. Right. Yeah, you, you can do that. The whole data, that means uh, they, they are not spread over, that's all data. Yeah. And then I uh, like to have some kind of the hot data sometimes, uh, a month or a daily. Well, good choice, good. You're, you're going to pay, um, in, in such scenarios, you're going to pay uh, in two ways. One, for the transfer cost. Generally, you don't pay to transfer data no. into a cloud. You no pay to transfer it out of yeah, a cloud. And, and second of all, you pay for data at rest. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, for example, hot data in your term, uh, in the Amazon world, uh, uh, their elastic block store service, yeah, that would be hot data, it's three cents a gigabyte per month. A cold data, so something that you don't access that often, mm -hmm. uh, you would store in a service like Glacier. Uh, Glacier would cost you one cent per gigabyte per month. Oh, I see. To store Glacier. that. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to mention, so um, the, the cloud resources are fantastic, but again, all the cloud resources um, are trying to accommodate all the potential IT architectures that are available. And they all do it with varying levels of success. So one of the things to consider is when you're doing this is to do a cloud architecture review and to look as, and that architecture review isn't just, you know, getting it to work, but maintaining it. So where are my costs? Where can I save money? How can I interoperate clouds in order to take advantage of the best features of each one of them? And how do I have, at least in my mind, some resiliency associated with that to say, well, if I'm using this particular cloud service because I really like it and maybe it's local and it's low cost, what's my exit strategy for using that resource? Just in case it becomes less attractive or goes offline or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, well, one of the concerns that a lot of customers have is what happens if my cloud provider disappears, right? And, and with a lot of, not so much on the infrastructure side, but on uh, software as a service, where they're hosting my football pool or something like that, where it's a specific niche area, um, what, what's my exit strategy if they disappear, if they go wrong? So it's good to think about it. It doesn't happen very often, but it's good to have that as part of an overall architectural yeah. review. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, Peter's right. Um, just because you use cloud services, it doesn't alleviate the need for strong uh, solution architecture and, and software design. That's really on you as application developers. Um, and, and that's also in particular true of you know security issues. That was raised a lot in Peter's talk. Cloud providers provide the best tools for security that I think you're going to find. But using them is up to you, and using them correctly is up to you. Um, so. Uh, Good point. So what's going on in Canada with respect to uh, uh, cloud computing costs? So we track uh, cloud computing costs in Canada. Um, right now, the average cost for a normalized instance is around $57 US a month. So that a normalized instance is one virtual CPU, two gigs of RAM, uh, around uh, 40 gig of block storage, and um, less than five terabytes of, of bandwidth. Uh, but we do believe this is going to come down uh, through competitive pressure. Um, the core technologies used in cloud are, are, are not magic. Uh, they're the same ones that are used in commodity web uh, services. You can get a, a, a web hosting service for two to six bucks a month. So for basic compute infrastructure, uh, prices are going to come down. All right, so I'm going to shift now and talk about Canary's cloud a little bit. So part of Canary's mandate is to support uh, private sector innovation and, and help uh, with uh, economic development through a knowledge economy. So we've, we have a cloud uh, that we put together in 2012 for startups and uh, for um, development test and pre-commercialization purposes, you can use our cloud for um, one year. Uh, 
And if you wish to use our cloud, the eligibility requirements are very low. You have to have an address in Canada and you have to have less than 500 employees. So uh, in the Victoria talk, we were, we, we were kind of laughing about this because less than 500 employees in a software company is hardly a small business. That's, that's a very big business. Um, you don't have to be incorporated. You can be a sole, sole proprietor. Uh, you just have to apply, apply to use us. And our, our cloud is a uh, infrastructure as a service. We have a data center in uh, Edmonton and a data center in, in Sherbrooke, Quebec. And we provide all the basic uh, uh, infrastructure services, uh, net, network, uh, storage, and uh, compute. Yes? Uh, what kind of servers? Uh, we, I'll, I'll talk about the quota that you get with the free service, so I'll just address that in a, in a slide. Um, but, <laughs> sorry, I'm fumbling here. So why, why would you use this service? Uh, this, is a, this is a slide that our marketing department put together, and it's a whole lot of reasons why you'd want to use it, but I got a better reason. So uh, when when um, people move off our cloud, we survey them. We send them surveys and ask them, you know, what what went well, what didn't go well. And you know, just this morning, I got a survey response from a user, and it really was a great summary. And what they said was, uh, "Why did I, you know, what did I get the most out of Dare?" It was the freedom to experiment, experiment without having to justify every dollar of cloud service fees. So, for me, that was a great. A uh, great testimony, but yeah. So I, look, I I quoted that exactly. That's why I had to write it down. I'd never remember it otherwise. Uh, we've had over 600 uh, businesses use our cloud uh, since it started in in 2012. Um, the the types of applications that are being developed range from scientific to social media to uh, networking. It's it's cuts across all all verticals. And if you're interested in reading uh, about some of them, we have a page with case studies there at canary.ca slash cloud slash case studies. So to, to your question, what, what do you get with this cloud? So free for one year, uh, you get a quota, and the quota is comprised of four virtual CPUs across up to four uh, compute instances. You get up to eight gigabytes of RAM, uh, you get up to 80 gigabytes of block storage across up to four volumes. You get 200 gigabytes of object-based storage, which is the equivalent of Amazon's S3 service. Uh, we have uh, two variants of Linux images that you can run, as well as two variants of Windows Server images, and we pay for the Windows Server license as well. Uh, there's all the bandwidth that, that you can use because it's on our own network, so you'll never pay a cent for data transfer in or out. And uh, if you need more resources than that, we, we provide those uh, for nominal fees. Um, we're a non, not for profit and we're not intending to uh, compete with commercial cloud providers. What we're trying to do is provide more businesses that will build, build business in the cloud. So if you could double this quota, this free quota, for $400 a year, which uh, in a commercial cloud, the equivalent would be around 2,500 to 3,000 US dollars. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm very pleased to um, say that we're adding uh, graphic processor units to our cloud as well. So within this quarter, sometime before the end of June, uh, there'll be uh, GPUs available. So if you're doing an application that uh, for example, gaming or 3, 3D or even for uh, some data intensive algorithms, uh, GPUs can be used as well for that. So those are coming. Um, if, you, if you wish to use our cloud, um, sign up is simple. Go to canary.ca slash cloud. There'll be a button there. On the button, it's, it says apply to DARE. Click the button. You'll go to a form. On the form, you just have to give us some contact information, uh, your name, phone number, email address. Uh, describe why you want to use the cloud. We're interested in who's, what, what it's being used for. 
and uh, and as long as you meet our eligibility requirements, so an address in Canada and less than 500 employees, you'll be uh, admitted into the cloud for a year of free free use. And usually, after application, within a day, we'll send you an email with a, a link to how to log into our portal, as well as credentials. Uh, we also use OpenStack as our, our management, uh, cloud management platform. So if, if you're familiar with Rackspace, or as Peter said, they use uh, uh, OpenStack for Bluemix as well. It's the same underlying OpenStack management platform. Um, so you can be up and running within uh, a day or two after application. Um, so what happens? I, I get a number of the same questions about this service. So what happens at the end of one year? Um, our, our fondest hope is that at the end of a year, you've developed a, a, a product, you've gotten some revenue, you can actually afford to use move that into a public cloud and, and pay your way. Uh, however, uh, not all applications are the same. Uh, if you haven't achieved that and you need a second year, you're, you're welcome to reapply to the program. And if we have capacity in our cloud, we'll, we'll uh, approve you for a second year. Uh, again, the same conditions apply. This, this cloud is not to be used for production purposes. So uh, it can't, you can't be running like a million subscribers on your app and generating revenue from all of them. That's production use. However, you are allowed to use it for pre-commercialization purposes. So if you are doing a beta trial with a customer, even if it's a, a paid trial, you're allowed to use our, our cloud for that. Um, migrating, uh, I'll just finish these questions and I'll open it up to, to broad questions. Migrating in and out of our, our cloud is relatively simple if you're a software developer. It, it means uh, taking a snapshot of your virtual machines and then downloading the image out of the cloud and then uploading it to another cloud. Uh, for data sets, you can achieve the same results using a utility like rsync. I've already talked about what production use is. It's like broad, high volume uh, use for revenue. Uh, one thing that is different about our cloud from commercial providers is we don't provide service level assurance for support. So there's no one there to answer the phone 24 by 7. We provide email support. We'll usually respond within an hour or two. And you'll usually get a resolution within a day, depending on the nature of your issue. But again, if, if you sent us an email at 3 AM on a Saturday morning, you wouldn't get a response until probably Monday or maybe Sunday if, if one of us is you know, working. And if you need more resources, they're available for nominal fees. Okay, so I'll open the floor to, to questions. Uh, okay. Um, you mentioned about other types of services that are going to be available, and I was just wondering, would that say include, for example, a photo, photo processing program? Uh, uh, we, we wouldn't have anything as specific as that, but as an example, we provide object storage um, like Amazon's S3, and that's where the, the most conventional use of that is storage of rich media like, like pictures, movies, sound, stuff like that. So, excellent. Okay. So in other words, the programs that you have on your own computer, obviously, you just use them and then you just upload the data or the pictures or whatever to, to the cloud for for backup. That right? would be one way to do it. But I, I would okay. recommend if that's what you w wish to do, you'd use a commercial uh, commercial service like Box or Dropbox or something like that. OK. Yeah, our, our cloud is more geared towards uh, people who are building their own software development or software okay. products or applications. Uh, yes. I asked you about the differences between the services between like Amazon and yours, but uh, well, how does it compare in terms of cost uh, when it comes to memory, RAM, and also data transfer? Uh, your cost compared to theirs? Well, like as players. I say, we we don't charge for the free quota at all, so you won't pay a cent. Um, if you do have to purchase additional resources, you'll never pay for bandwidth, and the um, for example, if you double the free quota, it's $400 a year. If you were buying that from a commercial cloud provider, it would be 2500 to 3000 US a year. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
thank you, Wendy. Uh, for the support at OS, does it include the Ubuntu? Too? Yes. Yeah, there's Ubuntu uh, 12.04 and 14.04. Thank you. Sorry. The gentleman in the, in the blue. Is this strictly for commercial ventures, or would you work for not-for-profit or social ventures and so on? Uh, yes, for, for not-for-profit and social ventures, we'll consider those on a case-by-case -case basis. And the, the, other, um, the other eligible users I haven't talked about is if you're uh, receiving funding from Canary for a research software uh, project, you also have the option of using this cloud for the evolution of startups in Canada. And it's going to be a fireside chat. We'll just set up the space and we'll kick it off. So, hi everyone. Uh, up next, we have the evolution of startups in Canada. And uh, it will start in a moment. So our uh, last speaker will be fetched from the pitch room. So how are you guys uh, doing so far? Maybe you guys can squeeze in, tighten up. See, that gives you uh, get cozy. Yeah, where's the fire, though? It's in Halifax. <laughs> Full group. So I'd like to introduce you our next fireside chat. Uh, it will be moderated by Dave Thomas. It will include Hussein Halak from Launch Academy, Daniel Sander from PWGSC, Dylan Fries from BCTIA, and Chin from Spring. So just they'll each get to introduce themselves. I'll introduce my lovely moderator and our presenting partner, David Thomas from Intuit. He's the senior marketing manager with Intuit's QuickBooks Canada, the online segment. He's an experienced integrated marketer who works with small businesses to bring them a full service online accounting solution. And he's a an vivid supporter of the startup um, community across Canada. He also helps Startup Canada actually carry and provide the startup finance boot camps across Canada. So if you haven't engaged with them, do so. Um, they have boot camps across Canada happening, and it's a great program. So without further ado, Dave, I'll let you take the stage, Thank and you. I'll share the microphone. OK, so let's start with who are you and what do you do? OK. This is my first question. That's very difficult. Thank you. My name is Hussein Halak, and I'm the general manager of uh, Launch Academy. I'm also the head instructor for our LEAP program, which is the Lean Entrepreneur Acceleration Program. Um, do you want more? I think that's more than enough. That sounds good. If you don't know Launch Academy, it's the, uh, the probably the leading tech hub of Western Canada. So we help early stage companies really come and find the community, find the education, find the mentorship to grow and become successful startups or fail really fast and go to the next thing. Hi, everyone. I'm Chin from Spring.is. What we are is we are a global startup school, and we focus on helping entrepreneurs answer four questions. Is my idea any good? Will people pay for it? How do I launch my company? How do I grow and scale my company? And how do I go out and seek funding from investors? Hey, I'm Dylan Fries. I work at the BCTI. So we are a company that is basically bringing together the tech community. We run a lot of programming. Our main mandate right now is to really build the next set of anchor companies for, for Vancouver and to make sure that this is a place that uh, big companies want to stay in and promote the, uh, the growth of entrepreneurship in Vancouver. Uh, I specifically am a senior analyst there and I uh, work in the programs department. So if anybody here is involved in any of our hyper growth or uh, our new fintech program, then you'll see me around a lot. My name is Daniel Sando. I work with Public Works and Government Services Canada, and I'm here to let people know that the government is interested in late-stage innovation. Great. So let's start with um, Vancouver. 
and talk a little bit about what the current state of the ecosystem is in Vancouver and, and what are some of the some of the highs, some of the lows that are going on right now? Anybody? Sure, can. yeah, I'll start. Um, I think one thing that most people notice and is discussed a lot is the fact that Vancouver is a very uh, early, uh, early stage company focused ecosystem. Um, for the most part, I think we have about 9,000 companies, 90% of which are below five, uh, five staff. So obviously that's something that uh, we as the BCTI and other organizations are working with us to, to shift the demographics towards the larger scale companies, you know, maybe 50 plus would be nice. Um, that really promotes a lot more talent in the city, a lot more experience, and uh, brings a lot more of the uh, investors that want to see these large growth companies up to Vancouver, down from the valley. Cool. I think um, we've seen some very interesting s changes in the ecosystem in Vancouver. Uh, about two years ago, the things that I noticed is that the ecosystem was very fragmented and organizations did not work very well with each other. So um, we started seeing new things like Startup Week happening just about two years ago, more meetup groups that are topic specific. So a lot of good growth. I think the biggest interest here is we want to try to differentiate ourselves. We don't want to be seen as you know the Silicon Valley of the North. We want to be really put ourselves on the map in a global scale, how are we going to actually make Vancouver stand out? I think the biggest way here is there are a lot of opportunities in that kind of sector. Like Vancouver is very well known for green ecotech sort of impact. That's one of the opportunities that are out there. There's a lot of many different kind of niches that we can really brand Vancouver as as well. Yes, so from what I've seen, um, obviously one of the things is um, there is little to be known about how the whole ecosystem works because everybody has their own view of it and they know their segment of it. So um, it's still hard to kind of get a holistic view that I've seen. Uh, what I've seen as well is there is the um, uh, there's a lot of interest for entrepreneurs who are at the later stage who've actually been in uh, the US and are tired of, um, let's say, the kind of lifestyle that is there to move here and start companies here or help build companies here. So we've seen a lot of them coming back here because of what Vancouver uniquely offers. So that's an interesting also um, play on things because we we seen we compare ourselves a lot with uh, with Silicon Valley and the differences but a lot of people come here for that difference and obviously there is a huge interest in entrepreneurship globally and uh, we it, Vancouver is not uh, strange to that a lot of people are realizing uh, from students to people who are working in an in, in industry are realizing that everyone is almost an entrepreneur, you're responsible for your income. So they're looking at ways of they can actually participate and go after that idea um, uh, more more so than ever. So we're seeing a lot of influx of um, people, entrepreneurs who want to start their own thing, looking for education, looking for a place to do that, looking for communities. Th these are the things that we're seeing from our side. So Chin, you mentioned that there's been a lot of development and stuff has started to take place, more events and that kind of stuff. Um, is the startup community evolving? Is it taking kind of a the next step into? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I see that there is more growth in the startup ecosystem. There is a lot more collaboration within the system as well. I think the next step for it is mostly to kind of brand Vancouver on a global scale. So Vancouver has been very focused on the, the micro ecosystem in itself. And I think right now the, the next step forward is just to really brand and put Vancouver out on the map, get people to be really interested. Why are companies interested in moving down to Vancouver? So same as Hussein was saying, you know, getting those people from you know, the States, from abroad. We're seeing a lot more companies like Slack, Hootsuite, global brands that are you know, establishing, establishing themselves here in Vancouver. And, and how, how do you do that as a community, as a whole, yeah. Um, to get the ecosystem and the reputation for the city on that global stage? Yeah, I, I think, well, I have my own personal thoughts, but um, mostly I think it's around branding ourselves strongly on certain points. Um, I, I'm really impact focused, so I think impact is one of the things that I believe passionately about. Uh, there are a lot of different things about, you know, the tech talent in Vancouver as well. Vancouver is very well known for producing good tech talent that is also, you know, affordable, not as expensive but at the same time, high quality as well. But yeah, I let the rest of them share their thoughts. Yeah, I agree. I think we have great universities here that put out a lot of uh, really intelligent uh, 
software developers. I mean, we have coding programming and um, really good opportunities for anybody that wants to get into the into the sector can get into it pretty quickly. Uh, so I think a lot of companies like Microsoft that just set up a big base here um, are starting to realize the level of talent we have up here and they want to kind of get access to it and tap into it. So I think as long as our schools keep putting out really uh, high quality graduates, it'll be good for the future. I would say it's also the collaboration between universities, accelerators, government, everything together. Good collaboration. What What's the biggest challenge facing Vancouver and the ecosystem right now? Like, what's the hot topic? What's the, if we could figure out this piece, we could take it to the next level? Um, I think two big issues right now are uh, funding. Uh, so companies that are trying to get uh, venture capital, it's tough to get in this city. Um, like was mentioned in the earlier chat, there's only about four or five uh, firms that you're really going to get much venture capital from. Um, I run a program called uh, Connection Days where I bring in venture capitalists from outside. So I work with um, investors from China, investors from the US, uh, investors from Europe looking to tap into our uh, ecosystem. And with our lower dollar, it's also of value. Um, another thing is the affordability of living here. So obviously, as Chin mentioned, uh, our tech employees are paid less than they are in San Francisco and in the Valley and in a lot of cities in the US, uh, which is a big driver for a lot of these companies is both the talent and the, the cheaper cost. But of course, with uh, Vancouver being a very expensive city to live, it's getting maybe a little bit more difficult to get those people to stay or attract other people to move to Vancouver to really fuel it. Um, um, these these challenges obviously are challenges, but what I'm seeing is, um, in regards to funding, um, historically, if you have a great company, if you have a great startup, and you built it correctly, you you would funding will come to you. So it's it is easier if you have people. Of course, if you are at the center of it, and you can find, uh, but. Um, it's never an issue if you get your company that is ready, like it's a company ready for funding. So one of the biggest challenges we're seeing, and of course, of course, the affordability of living, but the core challenge we're seeing is, number one, where the support goes. So there's support from the government, but where does it go? Where is it distributed? Is it distributed on the areas that really matter? So there's a lot of interest in growing the anchor companies to uh, push the big companies, but the biggest challenge with that is that those are not the biggest contributors to the economy. They're good to have good good names but the biggest contributors to the economy are the small and medium businesses historically these are this is where the the bulk of the economy comes from the bulk of the revenue um, uh, so uh, there's not a lot of uh, funding and support or this is the way that the funding and the support is distributed is either not there or when it's there is not really clear so I sit also on the small business council uh, uh, also, we talk about that, that there are some uh, programs, but there is little knowledge about them, little awareness in small businesses and for entrepreneurs. Uh, small business owners might not call themselves entrepreneurs because they think these are tech, or they might not call themselves startups, but they are. Um, the second element is education. There is little education. That's why a lot of startups fail. Uh, and they take a long time to fail, so it's very expensive. So it's, instead of failing after two years, why not fall, fail in the first two months and know that your idea sucks? You know, know in two months so that you can leave it and take on the other idea and the other idea after. So there's little education, little investment in education for entrepreneurs and for startups that we're seeing. I mean, it's great that we have now Spring University and we have those programs, but there's uh, the interest is always um, universities, as in the traditional universities. And we know those don't bring out uh, great entrepreneurs. Uh, just by the fact of how their programs work. There's nothing wrong with them, but just that's not their purpose. Uh, that's not what they found it of. So uh, this is, these, are, these are, I think, the, some of the bigger issues. How well are we educating the next generation of entrepreneurs? Are we, uh, so now there's interest in coding, for example, to go around in schools. But are we teaching people how to run a good business? Because most of them will have to. <laughs> A lot of them will know will need to know how a good business operate if those businesses are to survive. So, are we teaching that? Are we spending uh, enough on that? Are, are we investing in that? So, these are the issues that we see as a major thing, and we're taking it on at Launch Academy, and we're always lobbying for that. And when we talk uh, in our talks, focusing on. So let's shift a little bit then from the community's ecosystem to the importance of an ecosystem for the individual startups who are building their companies. Um, 
what kind of partners or mentors or um, whether it's an accountant or a, a lawyer or who who are the key kind of advisors and counsel that you should start to think about when you're when you're going to build a company? Okay, so I'll start. Um, first of all, everybody. <laughs> This is uh, because everybody's benefiting. Tech is the biggest contributor right now for BC, um, and it's growing really fast, and it has the opportunity to really make us a very rich province and, uh, and for Canada as well. So um, everybody's needed to help, and everybody can help, whether in a, low, like a little capacity or a big capacity. Obviously, there are areas where we need more. We need, we need more education for startups how to raise funding, so hence this, uh, this is a great forum, and a lot of people are participating in that. Um, and I think we need some of the uh, people who are successful, like the successful entrepreneurs, the people who made it, some of the successful uh, angel investors and investors. We need them to participate in, uh, to lead the growth of this ecosystem and to lead how, how it grows and how it grows faster and how it uh, produces greater results for us. So that's, uh, that's from our side. Um, like Hussein said, I think everybody is important to get in touch with. Um, the more people you talk to, the more you're going to learn about what is good about your company and what is bad about your company and where you might need to fix it. Um, what we always push is the, f the best thing to do is either figure out if your idea is good and is going to be successful, if it sucks and you should quit, or if you should pivot and, and redirect where you're going. And the more people you're talking to, uh, the more you're going to realize which avenue you need to take. Uh, so whether that's other entrepreneurs who have had similar experiences, uh, mentors who have actually had successful exits and, and can really guide you down the right path, or just uh, educators, whether that's a, uh, an organization uh, like a Spring or Launch Academy, or, or that's the government who's, who's, who's helping with uh, specific programming, or just uh, going and taking actual courses, or even just Google stuff, just learn. Yeah. Yeah, go out, talk to as many people as you can. There's always someone who has good advice for you. Tap into free resources. Any government department has free resources, like you can go talk to the CRA about the shred credit when you're doing scientific research. Come to us, talk about the BCIP program on how you can tap into that. And talk to Lamch Academy, talk to, to all the people in front of you. Network today, don't forget to talk to all of the people. Talk to Canary. <laughs> Mentoring um, is a theme that has come up consistently on these panels as we've done them um, across the country. What are your thoughts on the importance of a mentor and when you should go look for one? Yeah, I think mentors are a great thing because um, at the end of the day, when you're an entrepreneur, ideas might change, right? So you might think of an idea, you might work on an idea, you might find it's not a good idea, maybe people don't want to pay for it. Or even your team. Team is another big support um, around your idea. The team can still be dynamic as well. You might pe have people joining the team, leaving the team. But at the end of the day, if you can build up your own knowledge from the knowledge base that a good advisor or a good mentor has, you're really setting yourself in a good position to succeed, right? Because you want to start thinking about how can I avoid the same mistakes that other people have made? Do I have to actually reinvent everything myself? Which I think a lot of entrepreneurs have that mindset that, oh, I can go out. I can learn it on my own. I can find out. You know, I am that special golden child that will make this business succeed. So I think the, the key goal I'm trying to get behind is advice is very valuable. If you can accelerate that process, you can learn how to fail more quickly. You can learn how to actually avoid all those mistakes. And you can tap into the network that you have based on the mentor. If your mentor knows the right people, they can make introductions to you. That's a very valuable thing for you as well. Getting in front of the right, right investors, the right customers, those sort of stuff. Um, so... Uh, I quote uh, Pitbull, ask for money, get advice. Ask for advice, get money twice. <laughs> so um, mentoring, the, the biggest thing about mentoring is that um, as an entrepreneur, you have, let's say, look at education as two things. Structured education, which is programs that walk you through the steps that you need to go through to build a great startup. And um, 
uh, and build it in a way that you either find out if you if this is going to fail or doesn't work or there is no market or build that the, if there is a market and how to expand on it really quickly and capitalize on the opportunity. That's structured education. The unstructured education, which is equally as important, if not more, which is mentoring, where you actually get to sit with a mentor on an area that you're really struggling with or you have a challenge with, whether it's marketing, whether, let's say, it's fundraising, whether it's uh, finding the right team, working with a co-founder, legal sometimes, anything that you need, sometimes how to get uh, government grants and which grants you can go for. Mentors are invaluable because what they're going to do in half an hour sometimes or 20 minutes, you challenge, you you uh, post a challenge and they get all these years of experience, summarize it to you and say, okay, this is what you need to do, one, two, three. And that's invaluable because you probably have to go through years sometimes and never find these things that they've actually had to learn the hard way. So mentors are ex extremely important. Even when you're just toying with the idea, a mentor is important even for for like for achieving in life. So why not meet with people, network, um, and and get those mentors and work with them? So it, it's it's invaluable. Like you cannot put a value of what a mentor can do. Sometimes even if you had one interaction with them, it can save you thousands and sometimes like hundreds of thousands, not millions of dollars for for a mentor. So uh, I, I mean I can't thank anybody who's offered to mentor anyone enough, uh, whether anywhere you are, if you offer to give your time to that entrepreneur, you're actually helping them. You don't know who you're helping. You, maybe you're helping the next Facebook or Uber, who knows, by your advice and really shifting direction. Because if you look at it, it might be shifting direction like a little bit right now, but across the time, this is a trajectory. The impact is a massive. Okay, I'm sold. We all need a mentor. But now how do I how do I go get a mentor? It sounds great, it sounds amazing, but I don't know anybody, I'm just starting out, I'm a student out of, out of school, how do I go find this unicorn of a mentor? Yeah, so I think a lot of the accelerators and incubators in the city are a good place to start. Uh, Launch Academy, Spring, uh, BCTIA, um, there's, there's a, there's a t yeah, Futurepreneur, New Ventures BC, there's a ton of them. Um, and they have their own uh, EIRs or mentors that they'll set you up with. You know, For us, when you come in, we'll, we'll see what domain you're in and we have uh, about five EIRs we can set you up with that, that we think would be a good match and, and if they are it works out and if not then we'll send you to one of these guys and uh, odds are that they'll have somebody that's going to be a good fit for you. Um, there's so many people in this city looking to help and, and to help uh, see the tech community grow that um, really just reaching out is going to be the first good step. I love to um, speak on this as well because uh, this is one of the things that I like to teach my entrepreneurs. So I think when it comes to finding a mentor, there's a few steps that you can take that are very specific to actually finding a mentor. First thing is don't just go up to someone and say, hey, be my mentor, right? No one's going to be like, oh, who's this guy? So you have to build that relationship first. So I think the first step is first identifying what you want to learn, what you want to get out of the relationship. So if you're looking for a mentor or an advisor, two different things as well. Advisor is more business specific, a mentor is more in general, right? So you think about what are you trying to get out of the relationship? Who is best for it? Second step. So you find out who is the best person that I can approach. Then you start thinking, how can I approach this person? What is this person looking for in terms of someone that they want to mentee? Are they looking for a specific type of personality? Do they want you to ask challenging questions? Do they like people who have to hustle? So you, you know who you're looking for. Then you start thinking about how can I build that relationship with them? Do I go out to events that they go to? Do I start to network with them? Do I go out and you know, m know the people that they know? And then eventually, that's how you can slowly establish the relationship. Because at the end of the day, if you want to find a good mentor, he has to care about you as well. So if you can build that bond with them and they can actually care about you, then you're going to have a good mentor-mentee relationship. Great. Great. What? We've talked a lot about avoiding mistakes and failing fast and, and, and all those kinds of things. Um, what, what are some of the biggest and maybe you know, most common mistakes that are made early on by entrepreneurs? The biggest mistake you can ever make is saying, I know. I know how to do this. I, you don't know anything. <laughs> You have to start with, I don't know. If you want to be a great entrepreneur, you have to start with, I don't know what my customers want. I don't know if this is their actual problem. I don't know if my product's gonna work. I don't know if this is the right business model and keep searching for the one that works. And you search out there, not here. 
So the biggest mistake, the entrepreneurs that absolutely I had a most horrible time working with them is the entrepreneurs that know. Because they sit with you and all they want to do with you when you're mentoring them is really um, convince you that they're right. They just want you to approve with them. I don't know if any of you had that kind of experience. Somebody who's sitting with you and trying to convince you that they're right. And <laughs> it's, it's horrible. Like, it's, so just say, I don't know. I have a hypothesis. I have a guess. Because if you knew, and if those entrepreneurs knew, we wouldn't have the products that we have. So I think this is the biggest mistake, and this caused the most expensive failures. Failure is OK. What you want to avoid is not failure. Avoid expensive failure. Have like mini miniature, very cheap failures, a lot of them, and learn from them, and then move on to build your success. This is from me. Yeah, to, to build on that, the biggest thing is uh, not knowing your customer. So um, I, I meet with a lot of companies that come in and you know they, they come, come up with a problem and they build an entire product around it for one or two years and they've never talked to anybody except a friend who said, oh yeah, that's a great idea, put $400,000 into it of your own money and, and, and you'll be good. But of course, not talking to the customer, they realize that nobody cares about their product and nobody actually wants it and now you've just wasted two years of your life. So. Um, the whole I know thing is definitely extended to that. You have to talk to other people to really see if what you're doing is of value and, and if people really are going to use it because in the end, those are the people that are going to pay. And uh, don't ask your friends because they'll just tell you good things about it. What I saw a lot is also people having the mindset that nobody else thought about doing that. So my idea is so unique, nobody else is out there. There's always somebody else out there. Well, I guess if there's anything else to add, probably the concept of really sharing your idea. A lot of people are very hesitant to talk to other people about the ideas, but really it's all about, as a startup, you're just caring about making enough noise for people to even notice you. Don't worry about people stealing your idea. You know it's not gonna be easy to start a business. It's gonna take you at least seven, 10 years maybe to create a very successful business. If someone is willing to put forth that effort to take your idea and actually build a business out of it, good on them, right? So it's all about the hustle. So. Don't worry about sharing your idea. Go out. The more you share, the more feedback you get, the more you can improve the idea. One of the biggest um, gaps in skill set that, that we've seen, we've done some research around it as well, um, with entrepreneurs, especially early on, is a total lack of understanding the finances of their business and understanding the numbers and understanding you know, how to communicate that out, which which leads and helps feed that problem of trying to get funding. Um, is that something that you guys see on a regular basis too, as far as a lack of financial literacy? Yeah, there's uh, there's big um, issues with that. I'm sure investors would agree, like asking, uh, the, the entrepreneurs know what to ask. Like sometimes they say, I want $500,000 on which valuation? You know, like they, they have no idea. Uh, they have no idea. Like they just know I need 500K to survive, let's say, the next six months and pay for this and this. Um, why do they need it? How does it impact the business? All of that they don't know and how to actually like execute on that. So definitely financial knowledge is very important. Also investing some time in understanding how investors think if you're really going down the funding. And a lot of entrepreneurs, like the first thing you ask them is like, I want funding. Do you really need funding? Like the best, they don't consider the best source of funding, which is their clients. If you have a product that you can sell and generate funding, why do you want to go after funding? Like you really need to have a purpose behind that, and they don't think about that. They don't think, what am I going to do with the money? I'm going to how what is, what is going to impact? Is it scale? Is it uh, marketing? Where is it? So there's a, definitely a lack in that in that knowledge, and they need to uh, invest time. An entrepreneur at the first stage. And all the people who work at startup need to be generalists. So they need to know some of the information they need to know about most of the things that, or all of the things that takes to run a business. Then they get specialized after. Um, so on financial literacy, I think two things. One is just having a good understanding of your cash flow. Because at the end of the day, if you want to take money from someone, if you don't even understand how you're going to use the money, Sure thing, no one's going to give you money. Second thing is, if people are actually willing to give you money, you want to make sure that the money is spent wisely as well. But in terms of financial literacy, I don't think it's something that's specific to um, to an entrepreneur. What you really want to care about is, do you understand your customer very well? Do you understand your business very well? And can you surround yourself with amazing people who can actually help you get there? So 
not specific to the financial piece. If you don't know very well on the financial elements of the business, find someone who can support you in that element. But as the entrepreneur, you have to really understand your customer, you have to really understand the business. And then you have to think about how can you spend that money wisely, right? Yeah, I mean, you don't have to go get an MBA in finance. You, you know, it's, it's a lot of basic stuff. Um, you know, a good way to start would be uh, go online. You can find the early pitch decks of a lot of uh, massive corporations that are, that are in place today. And you can see their pitch decks from when there was, they were in the early days. And you can see what they included. Um, or you can ask somebody else for, for what you should be including because there's basic parameters of what investors and uh, other people are going to want to see in your financials and, and what you need to be able to be on top of. Uh, cash flow is huge, um, especially if you want to keep keep the most equity possible in your company. Big example, Plenty of Fish sold for over $600 million uh, last year, and he had 100% equity and never, never gave up any equity in the company, bootstrapped it. So, um, you know, it depends on if you want 70% of $600 million or 100% of $600 million, but I guess it's a lot of money. You don't really care at that point. Um, what we saw is that uh, when you try to sell us a product, let's say it costs two hundred dollars, we want to know how you came up with a sales price of two hundred dollars. And we had cases where people could not explain how they came up with the sales price. So you have to be ready to be able to talk about it, how you came up with your sales price. We have a couple minutes left. We can open it up to the floor. If there's any questions out there, raise your hand. Lana will bring you the microphone. Just hold. Um, saying you mentioned the differences between Silicon Valley and Vancouver. What are the main differences that people, why people are coming here for investment where Silicon Valley is now in the world for startups and I don't know if company. I'm qualified to say differences because I haven't even been to Silicon Valley yet. But what are so you seeing? But what, what people are saying why they're coming here is definitely the lifestyle. So mm -hmm. they say, the li I love the lifestyle of Vancouver. This is where I want my kids to grow up. So this is one of the biggest things that, uh, that some of those entrepreneurs that have shared with me, some of the senior entrepreneurs have shared with me that they want to come here. This is a great place to raise my family. This is where I want to actually. It, it gives me that space. It's, it's much more, it's slower, let's say, than New York or Silicon Valley. Like it's, there's a little bit of laid back approach and that's what I want. And these are not like uh, lazy entrepreneurs. These are like highly achieving entrepreneurs that want to do that. So that's, that's what they've shared with me. And definitely that's one of the reasons why I moved here. Because I, I, I worked in Dubai, it's, it's like faster, much, much faster pace than here, like 10 times as much. And uh, I, I wanted that, and it gives me that space where I can actually achieve what I want, but also give time to family, give time to, to what's important in life as well. Hi. Um, my question is, there's a number of different uh, accelerator programs, and you all offer your own unique sort of services. As uh, an entrepreneur and, uh, and a, you know, sort of a scalable startup, how can we most efficiently match ourselves to your program to, to sort of best suit us to obviously get uh, momentum quicker? So scalable, I think the CPIA is, is the best Yeah, so one way that we differentiate ourselves is that we focus on second stage acceleration, so companies that are in revenue looking to ramp up their growth. Uh, so we have a lot of support for your sales, your marketing, uh, talent acquisition, how to, how to build the best team. Um, normally when we have a company come in in their earlier stage, maybe creating the, the concept or creating the MVP, we'll send them to spring or launch. And sure, but so, sort of taking that back a stage, how would that, that, that entrepreneur know that BCTIA is the best place to go to or to Launch Academy is the best place to go to? They have, they have to search. They have to come into us. I mean, they can I obviously either they can either see the our websites because mm -hmm. I think it's clearly the kind of um, uh, the backtrack, like who who are the companies that we worked with, and at which stages. They can look at that, uh, and they can talk to us. I mean, we're available. We, for example, for us, Launch Academy, we run tours every week that you can come in, see the space, talk to us. We're very available. You can come to the to the to the just to the launch and just take my card, like from the general manager down. Like everybody's available. So that's, uh, and I'm sure the same. Like I the community is very open. I think that's one of the things we need to more exposure and we need to reach out. But the community is very open as well. And there's a collaboration between you all. If you want to speak to the Launch Academy, you might then turn around and say, well, actually, you know, you're. You know, Actually, you're better off speaking to absolutely you know, Spring or better off talking to I think to this is this is one of the greatest thing about the uh, the ecosystem in Vancouver that 
everyone here is committed, I mean, for us, we are a non-for-profit. Everyone here is committed to the success of Vancouver. And we realize anybody who <coughs> takes on a role, this is not a role that brings a lot of money, just to let you know. <laughs> but this is, when we take on this role, is to actually support the community and to build a community. That, and it's, it's a 20-year job. It's not, it's not like a two-year thing. So for us to work together, everybody's success contributes to everybody else's success. That's, that's what we know. I'll ask you one more then. A um, couple days ago we were in Victoria and we had this chat and um, there was a lot of talk about Vancouver, Victoria, Vancouver, Victoria, ecosystem here, ecosystem there, how do they play together, what are their, and they had very different challenges that they were trying to overcome. Um, they're trying to get the talent out of Vancouver into Victoria to work for their companies. Um, how, how, how do you guys see that relationship? between Victoria and Vancouver? I'm gonna leave it to the, the government here. <laughs> <laughs> he was on the panel in Victoria. I was on the panel in Victoria. <laughs> he was in Victoria. I live over there, work here, so yeah. work in both environments. So it's quite different. Victoria always feels a little bit belittled next to, to Vancouver, but there's no reason for it. They both have their sets of talents, they both have their Great companies and great startups. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I went to school in uh, Victoria at UVic, um, so having lived there for five years, I know how much cheaper it is to live. So if I was wanting to live on the West Coast and have that experience, but work in the tech community and maybe save a bit of money, I might move out there. I think that's probably a trend you might see starting to go forward. And uh, we work together with some of the accelerators and we have companies we work with that are out there and they come into the city for the week sometimes and uh, become part of the programming. But I think uh, as long as there's a, a ferry involved, it might be kind of tough to get uh, more ongoing collaboration, but for the most part, it seems to be going well. Um, I think it's also just getting the organizations to partner up and work more closely together. Like uh, one of the things that we're doing with Spring as well is as Spring University, a new brand, we are launching out in new cities in Vancouver, and Vi Victoria is actually one of the cities that we are exploring. How can we bring our content, our support to them, so that you know they can deliver the same kind of education programs to their entrepreneurs locally? As well? uh, yeah, one of the things that I uh, that I invite us to see is BC. So if you look at the BC Innovation Council, they're they're doing quite a bit to combine the uh, or to have the accelerators and the incubators and different programs work across BC with each other because um, everyone can empower that and I don't think uh, Vancouver is gonna if we want if we are to lead the world where Silicon Valley is actually missing out on that and I don't think they're gonna do that BC has a much better chance than Vancouver alone because if you look at if you look at outside Vancouver, then you really don't have a housing crisis. Just if you think Vancouver, yes, we have let's say the problem in housing. But if you look BC, then you have a lot of variety of what you can offer as a province, rather than let's say what BC, what uh, Vancouver can offer. And then we might be stronger in our offering for let's say cap venture capital for attracting talent here, mm -hmm. uh, which immigration is a big topic on that uh, to attract also uh, companies to move here. If we think B uh, BC. Okay, well, we'll leave it on that note. Um, thank you all for joining us, and thank you guys for listening and participating. And I think it's lunch. Yay! So go eat. That's why I came. Thank you. Well done, by the way.